Hi there. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. After last week's major uh, copyrighted football American game, the large plate. God, that's dumb. Uh, after this game, a lot of people have been talking about a commercial that was aired during the halftime show, I believe, uh, or around it, um, from an organization called He Gets Us. The commercial showed what looked to be AI-ish generated images of people washing feet. People who, I guess, for the context of this commercial, were supposed to be historic enemies. We saw a priest and what was supposed to represent a gay man. We saw environmental activists and a Native American having his feet washed by a cowboy and a, a woman at a family planning clinic being uh, having her feet washed by a protester. On the surface, this shows what was supposed to be a good message. Jesus didn't spread uh, hate, he washed feet. It taught humility, it taught forgiveness, it taught love. And I'm sure that that was what was going through the minds of the advertisers when they put it on screen. But when you look just a little bit under that surface, you see something quite a bit darker. First and foremost being that this advertising campaign was over a hundred million dollars. The, the, this ad itself cost tens of millions of dollars to run during this event. How much more good would that money have done if they had used it to lead by example and to actually support charitable organizations and to actually go out and do some of the good work that they think Jesus would have done in the world rather than proselytizing, preaching the new version of Jesus that they're finally ready to accept. And when I say that, I mean that this organization, He Gets Us LLC, used to be owned by the Servant Foundation, which was an anti-LGBT, an anti-choice organization, and a major donor to the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a prominent conservative legal organization which was instrumental in overturning Roe v. Wade and has fought consistently to challenge same-sex marriage and transgender rights. So when we look at what this organization actually is, it seems more like this advertisement is to save their face rather than to promote what Jesus taught. And most critically, when we look at the response, especially from conservatives and evangelicals, we see that this is not the Jesus that they want to see. This Jesus is far too tolerant, far too loving, far too woke. When you look at the comment section of these videos, you see, well, Jesus also rejected sin, like all these sinners that you're wanting me to love. Who would love these terrible people? When we look at what Jesus actually gets us, to do. When you look through the Bible, he gets us to excuse misogyny. He gets us to normalize hatred. He gets us to rally against our opponents, not love them. He gets us to ignore science. He drives division. He does not build community. And we see this over the course of his, uh, Christianity's history for thousands of years, only now progressively trying to become welcoming and open to LGBT people, to women, to you name it, to say, no, 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 please, 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 continue signing up, continue donating. We were wrong for all this time. Actually, when you re, 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 reinterpret all of these words, it actually means that you're just fine. We love the sinner. We hate the sin. At the end of the day, this commercial shows the dark side of Christianity that we talk about on this show. It shows the pain and, and the intolerance that we try to highlight on shows like these, because under that thin gilded veneer of love, you see the divisions that they themselves are trying to draw attention to. You see the hatred and the, the animosity that they are trying to use as a prop to drive their message. They're not fixing it. They're not dedicating their money or their time or their efforts to making anything better. They're using this massive platform and this massive opportunity to preach and to save face and to use the pain in the world around us as a costume that they can wear to drive donations their way. And that, well, that really sucks. It sucks almost as bad as having to find a new way to not say the name of that football sporting event for legal reasons while live on camera. But hey, we got a lot more than just that to talk about today, so I hope you stay tuned for the whole show. Call in if you're a theist and you have a lot of questions for us because we got three great, well, two great hosts and me today, and the show is starting right now.
Hello, hello, and welcome to the Aces Experience. I'm your host, Forrest Valkai. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you know that uh, today is February 18th, 2024. Uh, the Atheist Experience is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of uh, religion and government. And with that, we can finally start talking like humans. I'm joined today by Armin uh, and Seth. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. Good to be here. I'm super Thanks glad for having us. You, seriously, oh, it's amazing. No. Don't thank me. I'm just, I'm just here. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the, the, and I'm just going to, I mean, I think you can say the name of the game, by the way, there's some yeah. trivia involved with that. So many people typing it into Google will put the space in the wrong spot between the words and it comes out superb owl. And so apparently there are Google searches designed for people who misplace <laughs> the space. And there's a whole litany of superb owl images that you can now, huh. there's like a superb <laughs> owl website. I learned that a few <laughs> days ago. I thought it was brilliant. But anyway, I just, I, it, News Nation had me on last year to talk about the first incarnation of the He Gets Us campaign. And they were talking mm -hmm. about some of the stuff you did like, well, you know, some of these people give a lot to charity and isn't it an encouraging message? And I have a gripe with that a little bit like I have a gripe with the new God and Country documentary, which I am thankful for. But it's this rebranding of Christianity so that this happy, clappy Jesus never wants to bother or judge or be discriminatory or, you know, he mm -hmm. loves everybody. It, it, whenever I see pastors mm -hmm. do that, I'm like, thank you for being so generous and humanitarian. But have you read your own Bible on these things? And it's it's mm -hmm. interesting to watch Christians really cram their own ideologies and value system into something and then call it Christianity, right? It's yep. It's been an, a weird evolution or, or devolution of Christianity over the last, I don't know, few decades anyway. Yeah, it, it, it really is strange how like, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this on the show before, I know that like when the people around me say, oh, we have to go to church and get these values and it's all you, you go there to learn how to, I guarantee if they went to a church that preached something they didn't like, they would move on to the next church. And like you, you hear this constantly. I'd be like, oh, I didn't like that church. I had to move to. I have family members who tell me about that. Say, oh, I, I went to this church for years, but then they, the new preacher was a jerk. So I went over here or they, or they started teaching me to, you know, love all these gay people. And I moved on. I went to this other church that said, they, and like, I guarantee that, you know, 100 people in that church are clapping and waving their hands for all the things that you don't like. Um, and then you went to this other one for another 100 people who are clapping and waving their hands, something you do like. It's just, it really is your morality. It's really your ideals yeah. and your values and your politics. And you're just looking for somebody to say that God agrees with you. You don't actually give a damn what yeah. the Bible says. You don't give a damn what the preacher says. You don't give a damn what the church says. You want somebody to agree with you and you want that person to have some sense of authority to you. And that's that's what you're looking for. Um, so it's really it's just it's deeply gross when you look at it through the historical you know line of, of who it's been OK to hate. And now we have to find a new group so we can continue driving in donations and continue calling this a holy war. You know, I, I noticed what Seth was mentioning. That's exactly what's also happening within Islamic teachers and preachers um, within their scholars. And well, and I think this is a defense mechanism and it just shows that we're winning and we have the upper hand and this is a defense right. mechanism. And when you see yeah. them on retreat, it doesn't mean that we should just accept it because they're weaker and we're winning. And we, I think we should just go for complete annihilation of it. Like I, I noticed a lot of atheists just accept it. Oh, like, look, they changed. Now we can accept them. No, th this is just a defense mechanism. If they get the upper hand, they will come back with full force. So when you see them in retreat, go for the end, go cut the throat yeah, well, and that's the thing yeah that's, that's, that really is i think that's what he's to hold on hang <laughs> on. i'm sorry if i see dr Kristen dumay who's a theology professor and she is like uh, john pavlovitz who's like andrew whitehead who's like robert p jones etc and they they hold to a flavor of christianity that would never there it wouldn't god would never send anyone to hell god does love every let's say they have manufactured a more humanistic religion for the moment i'll take that if they're on mm -hmm. my side when it comes to state church separation they are now my allies after we have mm -hmm. sort of put out the immediate fire then we can get into you know the semantics of the theology but as far as values we line up so when it comes to people like them no i don't want to crush and cut their throat 
I'm thankful <laughs> that we are allies in state church separation and humanistic values, even if we disagree on some theology. Does that make sense? I can vibe I would, where you're coming from. I don't agree entirely, but I like it. It sounds nice. <laughs> I, I, well, I would I'm let, just the Mr. Rogers of the movement here. I'm over here. <laughs> ways to the well, movement, so, apparently, so. I would like to separate the Christian from the Christianity. I would accept them as allies. I wouldn't accept their Christianity. I would accept as individuals. I would give the credit to their kindness and their good positions that they have to them as individuals, I would refuse to accept that they're getting that from Christianity. So again, I separate the ideology from the individual. I, I, I will accept the individual as my ally. I just don't want to embrace Christianity. I don't want to embrace their version of Christianity because as long as you're using the word Christianity or Islam, it, you're basically embracing or giving some form of authority or legitimacy to that book, the Bible or the Quran. And basically this is whitewashing that book. So again, I try to separate the individuals from the ideology and embrace them, but not the ideology that they're trying to sell. But well, one last thing, I forgive me for us and our oh, By all means. But the, the planet's most popular religion if you say christianity is this mm -hmm. then that's a, a tremendous oversimplification it's like saying you know muslims are that like a christian is this they could be a hardline bible banging hell and and brimstone uh you know literal genesis six-day creation they could be can they could be one of those christians or they could be one of these people who doesn't even own a bible but they like jesus because mm -hmm. he's awesome and he thinks about Jesus when he smokes weed and he calls himself a Christian, but he doesn't go to church or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, and then there's the spectrum in between. So labels, I think, are useful. But when we say the Christians, all I'm saying is that I try to step a little more softly and say, well, who are they? What are their value systems? Are they bigots? Are they people who are agents of destruction in this world? Or are they joining hands with other humanists, even if we disagree on the theology? But I totally take your point. Mm -hmm. We don't want to legitimize a superstition. I buy that totally. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it is a weird thing because like I'll I, I, I agree in that, like, you know, I, I'm I have no no issue with individual Christians or individual religious people of any caliber. Like, I no problem if it I, I don't want to be hateful towards people. But absolutely, there the ideology is an issue, and if it's going to come to the point of me, uh, like you said, legitimizing or even just like tacitly endorsing by being, you know, sharing the the, the stage with them, um, I'm I'm never going to say like I will never appear with any religious person ever. But there's a reason why I wouldn't do like a, a side by side show like this. You know what I mean? With with, with a religious person for that reason. Um, no, I would. Because I see the amount of the amount of harm that it would do, and it it, it just it's not in any way worth it for me. There's a good example. I I have a, a a guy that I'm mutuals with on TikTok that I've talked to before, who does amazing work. He's a a, a Bible scholar. Um, does incredible work teaching or d dispelling myths about like, oh well, I'm Christian, therefore I can hate gay people, or I can be this, that, or the other thing. And like, he'll actually actually here's the research on it and why you're wrong and all these things. But the dude's also a practicing Mormon. And so, like, as much as I love his work and I support what he does, I'm not going to do a show with him or, or or platform him any further than I, I because he is an active member of an organization that is deeply racist and sexist. And well, let and me put a caveat. And like, like I you know have I, mean? I have a believer on and we do a show in tandem. I think if we're mm -hmm. challenging each other. If we're having a good faith, if we're good faith interlocutors in the arena of ideas, if I bring on a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witnesses or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, and we engage not in a way where I'm just lying down or ignoring the elephant in the room, but there's honest, good faith engagements in the arena of ideas. I don't think that's a sellout. And I would do that every day of the week. Now, would I sit side by side with a believer on a show formatted like this? Obviously not. I think it's situational. I don't know. I, I just, I'm doing a lot of throat clearing here, but I want to make sure that context is king. Yeah. And that we are not dehumanizing or just writing off people based on a label because oh, people yeah. are complex. So I, th I don't think you've said anything mm -hmm. that's wrong or, or worthy of, of, of criticism. Oh, God, I want I... that to be my ringtone. <laughs> Seth, I don't think you've said anything that's wrong. That is not my... <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, Did no, someone it, say it's... that? You've got three. You've got three atheist <laughs> activists sitting up here, each with our own styles, and I think we're all going to find different ways to do it. What's funny and is that's when I found out I was doing the show with you and Armin, I told Katie, I was like, "All right, so you've got two machine guns and and a water pistol, 
essentially is what this show is. So I'm just sitting, I'm, I'm waiting. Not that moist. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I before we I do want to clarify something. Here we okay, go. so we don't I don't I don't want to clarify. dehumanize Muslims or Christians with regards to the religions, Islam or Christianity or other religions. I know there's a lot of different interpretation um, and methods of expressing them. The the thing that they all share I hope I'm not generalizing. Let me know if I do. Is that they use faith and revelation as a methodology to come to the truth. And that's the core element that they all share that I have a problem with. And that's the destructive part of it. So I don't know if we have the Taliban version of Islam or, I don't know, a modern Sufi version of Islam or a modern version, LGBT friendly ver version of Christianity or people who did the Inquisition or whatever. The, the point is like these are different conclusions, but the core that is the harmful element that they all share is that they have a flawed methodology to come up with conclusion, which they rely on faith and they rely on revelation. And that's why we should be against all of them and against all different variations of them. I don't care that you sometimes they come up with the, the ideology, not the people. Sometimes it has the right conclusions. Those are the accidents, right? When it comes, we have the scientific method, we have critical thinking, and sometimes they have flaws, but we have shown that those methodologies give us more true answers than wrong ones. Like on average, they perform better. So just because sometimes they come up with the wrong conclusion, that, shouldn't not, that should not be used as a way to excuse the methodology. And just because the scientific method sometimes makes mistakes and doesn't come with the wrong conclusion in the same way, that should not be used as an excuse to dismiss the methodology. So I think like some positive like kumbaya lgbt friendly democracy like non-violence versions of islam or christianity that is it we have to celebrate the people but we have to be very very careful for that not to be used to make it seem like these methodologies faith and revelation can be used as a reliable source they cannot be and they should be fought against always at all times that's my point i think Anyways, no I, th I think that goes so. back to where we started when we were talking about you know like the the the, these the churches that are now very welcoming of, of LGBT people in the same way that just a couple of decades ago, it was very controversial. They were very welcoming of, of intersex or sorry, uh, interracial marriage. Um, and then a little while ago before that now, Oh, they're very controversial because they're opening to, uh, to people who are divorced. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, uh, we, we can't let in these. The Bible's very clear about divorce. Okay. Well, donations are going down, but so I guess we'll get with the times, but it's because of love. It's because Jesus and all the things. And then, mm -hmm. You know, interracial marriage comes along. It's like, oh, well, you, yeah, you sure you married a, a black person, but hey, we, uh, I guess Jesus, give us money, please. And then now at the end, it, we're here, we are like, okay, yeah, you're trans, but like, we also would still like you to put $20 in the offering plate because it's got to keep on someday. So, you know, Jesus said, that's cool. And it, like, and that's, that's the history of it. It's, it's, it's I think being dragged though, kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Beyond just the transactional nature of it, you know, we need to remain relevant to evolve with the times. I think people have always created gods in their own image. So I think there are some people who would, they don't have judgment and hate in their heart, but they were raised Christian or they're, they're in that culture. So what are they going to do? So they fabricated Jesus that looks kind of like them. And cultures have done this worldwide. This is one of the reasons we have Middle Eastern Jesus. We have white Jesus. We have African Jesus. We have Asian Jesus. We have Native American Jesus. We have black Jesus. There are churches and you can go in and see the Jesus they have in the oil painting in the lobby. And it looks like the culture that celebrates that Christ. And that's no accident. I think people have long built gods that look and sound like them, which is, it's quite suspicious for sure. Yeah. There's uh, the whole, uh, I forgot who said it, that, you know, the uh, man-made God in, in his image, uh, hateful, violent, uh, xenophobic, uh, uh, fearful, cruel, and all these things. And it's, it goes the same way when you talk about when you got to get, you know, people and when you got to get asses and seats, you got to make or, sure they have somebody or, to recognize. Or they build a God that they believe loves everybody and uh, and is in control and will take everyone to heaven. I mean, I, I think people, people construct the methods for coping. And mm -hmm. I think as long as there is suffering in the world, people are going to look to the heavens and they're going to hold to the idea of a God. Doesn't mean that they're bigots and they're all ugly and they're stupid and all those other things. Some people... You know, they use God to excuse bigotry. Some people are simply looking for answers and some people are hurting and they have constructed a mechanism or embraced a mechanism, true or not, that they use to get through. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that that deserves empathy and compassion.
So you're seeing this from this this uh, uh, utilitarian and, and from a guy movement. who was a freaking Christian for thirty some years. Yeah. Two and I'm, yeah, yeah, and I'm looking at it as a domestication tool for humans. And you want to go? You want to go for us? Do you come on? You, <laughs> me, and Armin, let's go, baby. Let's, this let's this go. is why I love the three host shows <laughs> because we have like a really cool like collection of views and ideas and opinions, and it shows that the atheist space isn't a monolithic thing. You know what I mean? That's that. I love yeah, that. I totally I, I get it. I I really I do. People I need to see that. It. The idea of of trying to modify a lie into a more egalitarian lie at the end of the day, it's still a lie, and I receive that and I understand it totally. So, I I love this show already. We haven't even taken a call yet, and we're 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 killing it, yeah. we're crushing it up in here. Two Disgusting. machine guns and a squirt pistol, baby. We're we're gonna buy a van and hit the road. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. <laughs> We none of us none of us is excusing being dicks to anybody religious or otherwise. That's true. I just wanted to be true. clear about that. that yeah. We're not we, we may do it. We're not excusing it, Armin. Right. <laughs> it may happen. Oh God. It's it, uh the, the all right. So thank you so much for tuning in to the uh no dicks parade uh, here where we discuss <laughs> religion and, and and how we think about it. Uh we're gonna jump into calls now. <laughs> Uh, and we've got a bunch of them lined up. We've, we've got like two dozen people waiting on the line. Some of them look really interesting. Um, uh, I'm going to start, uh, uh, heaven help this poor guy who has to listen to all three of us. We've got Adam calling in from England, uh, who wants to talk about the design argument. Adam, you are on AXP with, uh, uh three people all at the same time that you don't want to talk to. Hi, welcome to AXP. Hello, Forrest. Hello. Uh, yeah, hi, Armin so tell, and Seth. Tell hey. us what you're what you're calling about. Tell tell us a little bit about what you mean by the design arguments, because I I know what that means to me, and it's uh, Lord, it's frustrating. But I I want to hear maybe you have a different take on it. Okay, yeah, um, I've just called you to talk about the relationship between information and design, and the the possibility of inferring uh, God the Creator from that. What do you mean by information? Um, well, we, in order to have information, um, we have to have like the specification of certain values and sure. basically I understand that there's quite a few, um, there's quite a few disagreements about this notion of complexity and, uh, simplicity. So what I've basically called to say is that the, um, the basis for the claims I'm going to be making is a model of how design works, uh, in which design is the relationship between minds and informational structures. So, okay. Obviously, there's there's strong disagreement. There's strong disagreements between whether c complexity even implies uh, the existence of a of a mind. But um, my position is that the conversation has been impeded by disputes over whether it is complexity or simplicity that that implies design. But what I propose is that we have a model in which information information vehicles and mind have a precise relationship, and that will allow the overcoming of those obstacles. Lay it on us. So are you asking me to give a definition of information? No, I just wanted to make sure I knew what you were talking about, uh, because when people say information to me, um, a lot of the times they say, well, you know, DNA is a code and that's information and therefore information can only come from a mind and therefore there must be a mind that uh, forcibly code informa coded the information in DNA and that mind is God and blah, 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 blah. And so when you say information, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing, because if you're talking about just like the nature of complexity as a thing, then, OK, that's one series of arguments that we can go down. But if you're going to sit here and try to tell me that, like, when I look at DNA, uh, just as an example, uh, you know, that that uh, it's coding a sequence of things that's telling my body what to do. And that, therefore, is like a computer code and must be some sort of intelligence or then we're going to have a, a long and weird discussion. And I would like to avoid it if possible, because it's a really, really, really weird argument that doesn't make any sense at all. So I just I want to understand where you're coming from. So I don't have an argument that you're not trying to have when you say the word information. That's all. Can we get to the argument, though, because I'm still waiting for an yeah. argument. I would love to hear it. Yeah. OK, so I'll just jump straight into the argument. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. OK. So I'd say um, the first thing to point out is that the scope of possible information is infinite. 
Um, selection okay. from an infinite set requires representation of information and free will. Um, only minds represent information and free will and have free will. Uh, the fourth point would be an inference. So if the universe consists of specific information, uh, then it was selected from an infinite set. Point five would just be the, inf uh, the universe consists of specific information. And then the conclusion would be, therefore, the universe was selected by a mind. And of course, that mind would fit the definition of God. Okay, so it's almost exactly what I was talking about, just not not with DNA, but with literally everything. Is that what I'm what I'm getting? Okay. But is that is that what I'm what I'm hearing? Is it like the the information is a thing, and and therefore, in order for information to be selected for and 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 processed and made into something useful, you need a mind, and that mind is God. Is that? The long and short of it, it's, it's exactly what I was saying. It's how, do really lame how, how do you define a mind? Okay. How do you define a mind? How do you define a mind? Uh, uh, something which can represent information and has free will. How do you? I got, how do you? I'm sorry. Go how ahead. do you define free will? How free do you define free will? will? The, the it would be the unconstrained capacity to represent information. That's that's just yeah, so I, to me. It seems like to me it seems like you're defining a mind in a way that as long as we have inform, as long as you could represent what what is in front of us as you know some sort of information. To me, it seems like you're defining mind in a way that will just make it necessarily true. And because now you're defining God, something that has a mind, now we have a God. It just seems like you're just doing a wordplay. Does that what it seems like to you, Boris? It just seems like you're trying to play with words and de use definitions of word in a way that will make God necessarily um, existing based on your def definitions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot like when people say like, well, if natural selection is a thing, then who's doing the selecting? And there must be someone you know, deliberately. Do it's, it's that same kind of thing where it's like, okay, yeah, I guess, but not really, you know? Um, you know, when we talk about information, you can draw information out of absolutely anything, whether or not it is actually a source of information. If I see a fairy ring on the ground, you know, the mushrooms growing in a perfect circle, I can explain why that happens. But if I don't know off the top of my head, then I can say, ah, this much means something. And then I use this symbol, this knowledge that this thing exists as a signal to go do something else. That's me gathering information and utilizing it in a in, in a way, whether or not it actually means anything, whether or not it was supposed to mean anything, I can call that information. Um, the sequence of amino acids making a protein is information. It's 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 a set sequence of things, and the functional or the protein at the end would not be the same if these were to change. And so, like you can call that information, but at the end of the day, any random assortment of amino acids. It is is information in the same way, and it means just as much nothing. So, like, it sounds like what you're doing here is you're looking for patterns in nature, um, or or really just anything. By the way, you're talking about it, anything existing in nature, and assigning it this value as information, quote quote, and then saying, well, therefore, there must be this mind out there that's that's assembling this in such a way that it, it functions and all that. And it's just, it's the same. It. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like the exact same argument as the people who say like, oh, well, the eye is so perfect that clearly somebody must have designed or DNA is so perfect and you can't make random changes to computer code. Therefore, you can't make random changes to DNA. It's so perfect. And that's me must have a, a, a designer, a coder or whatever like that. It sounds the same way, just blown up to a cosmic level. And I don't really see the difference. So if I'm missing something, let me know. Okay, well, I'll respond to what you said first, and then I'll respond to Amin. So sure. in response to you, I think what you're talking about is interpretation. So, of course, we can interpret patterns in a flawed way, but um, the, the mere fact that certain pattern, that patterns consist of information is something um, which your interpretation still depends on. And so the examples that you gave of, you know, misreading natural signs and imp imputing some kind of semantics from the natural signs, um, those would all fall into the model that I'm proposing, which is what relates design and information. My Right, but what, what about the things that don't require interpretation, like 
amino acids forming a protein that doesn't require any interpretation. It just works because of chemistry. So like you could easily call that information as well. And it is something that, you know, mechanisms in your cells that don't have brains or minds or anything like that are interpreting and, and, and functioning based on. So like, is that also information? If not, why not? Does that require a mind? If not, why not? Like, what are we actually talking about here? Um, well, when it comes to like natural substrates, um, we can of course use natural things to um, serve as the basis for like computation. So like we use computers, for example, which are just, you can say, well, a computer is just silicon and copper um, and it's just a bunch of moving parts, but we still, we interpret, we, we use that to interpret um, all sorts of um, different uh, meanings for, from what's happening, even though what's happening on the inside is purely functional and doesn't need, it doesn't need interpretation to work. We, we can still, we can superimpose our interpretation onto it. And you could, you could basically do the same thing with biological um, moving parts, components. You know, you could just, um, I mean, that's kind of what, that's kind of what, um, say, for example, um, Stephen C. Mayer, who, who you've criticized, um, th that's what the, that's what the um, creationists are doing, according to the atheists, right? So the, the creationists are looking at the biological components, and then they're misinterpreting what it means. That's, that's what I, that's what I mean. Is it, um, is it right if I just respond to Armin? Yeah, but by all means. Yes, go now, before you do that, can you tell me what you mean by God? Before I do that, yeah, um, I just mean uh, a mind which is omniscient and omnipotent. Okay, so, so um, you, you're using words like you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, you respond to me before. I'm sorry, okay, all right, um. Yeah, so you're asking me if I was just kind of doing like a play on definitions. So I've like kind of like defining um, mind some relationship and then just um, concluding trivially that there's that there's a mind. Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't doing it like what you're saying. It seems like more judgmental than what I made it. Uh, what I was saying. So, so you agree? You, we have these words like mind and free will, right? And do you agree that these are human centric words, right? Like when we we come up with these words to describe a human human experiences and then we went and looked into nature and to see if other there are other things like it uh, that we are experiencing like th this came from a human perspective look at the nature right so when it comes to a mind we understood that we have a mind and we 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 it seemed to us like we have a mind and we have free will and that's how we defined it because we had these things so it's human centric do you do you agree with that I'm not sure. I'd say that more or less everything's like that. And so I'd say that we observe patterns which are objective, and then we can come up. That's with not. It. That's not what I'm asking. That's uh, not what I'm asking. Do you, I'm yeah. just saying, like as humans, we came up with words, right? And these words, like free will and mind, are things that we think we have, and we define them with our experience of the universe in mind. The word mind and free will. Do you agree with that or not? Um, my position on that is that that is true, but they refer to something that objectively exists. Okay, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. Obviously, not just a. Okay, but he, that's not my my. Okay, so and the, what the word each one of these words, the definition of these words, these are just agreements that we have with each other, right? And the line where something is a mind and it's not a mind, it's not a clear line. These are based on the definitions that we're using. Some things like it's a little bit gray. Do you agree with that? Free will, mind, these are words that are not like complete. It's not like math. It's not like numbers, right? These are just agreements that we have with each other as humans. And sometimes these lines go back and forth. Do you agree with that? No. You don't agree that the word like mind and free will, like if people have different understanding of what, the, what these are and the definitions can change from one person to another? Well, you don't agree with that? Yeah, I mean... If I mean, it comes back to interpretation. Of course, people have different ideas, but that doesn't mean that they're all wrong or that they're all right. 
I didn't say they're all wrong or they're all right. I'm just saying like words, words are social constructs that we come up, we use as as we come as a society, we come together and we decide what these words mean so that we could communicate with each other. And their their lines are not as clear and sometimes they move a bit. That's how words work, right? Yeah, but that doesn't mean that my right. so now something we can I didn't say I didn't I just said yes or you said yes. I'm not coming up with any other conclusions with this. So the word mind, given that the word mind and free will, given that these are human centric, we can define them in a way that is limited to only humans, which is not very helpful. It, that this word will not have that much of a utility if it was like that. And we could also define it in a way that the definition becomes so loose and so over, you know, uh, included so many things that um, even describe things like what you're trying to describe, like things that are any form of, I don't know, selection of information, um, any process of selection of information could also be ca called a mind. So when it comes to words, we try to come up with definitions of, for example, a definition for the word mind or free will that has the highest amount of utility. If it's too restrictive, it, it loses its utility, but it's also if it's too inclusive, it will lose its utility as well. So when we look at the word mind, given that it's trying, it's a human centric, uh, it's a description of something that is human centric, we are basically looking into nature and calling things mind that is kind of close to what we are experiencing as humans um, as a mind. And if it's, so the question is how close does it have to be? Like, does a dog have a mind? Okay, probably yes. Does the ant have a mind? Okay, now we, now we have to, what? wonder what are we talking about what are we talking what what does the word mind mean does a rock have a mind does the tree have a mind okay we it seems like we have gone so far off the human experience that if we call those things mind as well like if, a, if then the, this words is too inclusive this word mind is too inclusive and it, it loses its ut utility so when it comes so you're trying to prove the existence of god and we could loosen up the definition of words uh like my to, to be able to prove that your God exists because your God has to have a mind and has to have a free will, we could play around with the definitions of word like mind and free will in a way that actually it describes things that we know that are happening in nature. So you're seeing something that actually happens in nature and we could loosen the definition of mind so much that includes that those events as well. And now voila, your God does exist. But have we now butchered the, def the word mind so much in a way that it's not, it doesn't have any utility anymore. Do you know what I mean? You're being too inclusive with what you include as in the mind. It's too far off from the human centric experience that we have. The, the, the point of the word mind and free will was to describe things that was close to a human experience, but now you're attributing it to things that is so far away. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Uh, I understand what you're talking about, but I would say that yeah. Um, this is not something that I'm doing. So, for example, I'm saying a mind is capable of representation, for example, semantics, and that a mind also has free will. But in my view, not everything, not everything is capable of semantics, and not everything is, not everything has free will. So that's how yeah, the, mind is defined. The, in my, in my the way mind. you define, defi the way you define free will. Go on, so far as you want to say something. Yeah, it's just it's it. What's what's frustrating to me about this is that like. This is exactly the thing that I was talking about, just with a little bit more fluff added. And and like it's what it sounds like you're doing here is you're saying, here's some things that seem intentional in the universe. Here's some patterns that I see, or not even patterns, just here's here's things that exist that I can attribute some sort of intentionality to potentially using apophenia and paleodelia uh, paedelia that we all have, or paedelia, pardon me. Um I can, you know, say that this is information and I can say this is what a mind looks like and I can kind of squint my eyes and turn my head and make this thing that looks a little bit like intentionality and therefore there's a God. And what you haven't done is shown any reason to believe that this thing exists at all. You've just said, this looks like a pattern to me. And it's like, cool. And then what? Can you show a mechanism by way this thing works? Can you show like a reason for me to follow you down this logical pathway besides just like, well, it kind of seems that way. Can you, you know, enunciate a little bit better what information is in a real actual functional sense? Like you were talking about uh, God as, as 
omnipresent and 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 or omnipotent and and you know all knowing and all these different things and like all these other contradictions it, it, it's just it sounds to me like a bunch of word salad and i'm trying to dig around in here and find some sort of actual thread of logic and i all i'm getting over and over from everything you're saying is just like it's some fill in the blank looks intentional therefore probably god and i don't get it and armin's trying to like dissect the words you're using to show that like hey you're kind of given a lot of unnecessary lean uh, leeway to these definitions that it really isn't justified and like i i don't i just don't get where we're going with this at all and i i can't tell if i'm missing something very big like maybe i just didn't hear you right or if there's actually just nothing here to talk about and i i'm hoping that we can elucidate the situation because it's it's just glaze i think think that was what seth was putting in the chat just glaze from the audience okay well, i think that what might be missing um is just like an elaboration of how the model works that relation that relates information and mind so it's not so much that i'm just looking at patterns and kind of concluding in a probabilistic way that maybe you know that it seems like there's intentionality or something um the model um, consists of this key, one of the key ideas that it consists of was uh, contributed by the intelligent design theorist, uh, William Dembski, is this idea of specified information. So this is really pivotal to the design argument. And the, way, the only way that something can be specified from a range of possible values is if there's a mind present to do the selecting. So okay, give, give me. I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I apologize, Adam. I, I know you just started speaking. I'm sorry. I know that's frustrating, but like, I feel like we're getting the same nowhere. Give me one example, one concrete example of information that needs to be selected for from infinite values that you're talking about. So, uh, for example, just like a number. So, like the set of numbers is infinite. Not, not and, not a uh, not a theoretical one. I mean, one one in the real world that we're talking about. You said God has to choose from these infinite examples. What's one thing that you can point to right now and say this is a thing that's in the universe that I can see and interact with, and this is a thing that was chosen by God to be this way. And here's all the other examples. Okay, um, so um, for example, laws of physics. So if you take Einstein's mass energy equivalence. So everybody knows it is E equals MC squared. Mm -hmm. And okay. So, so the laws of physics could have been the laws of physics could have been any other thing, but they are this exact way that allows for our universe to exist in the way that it does. Therefore, because they're not any other thing, God must have chosen this one possibility out of all the other possibilities. Is that a summary of what you're saying? Yes, missing a couple of points. He says, but yeah. He says okay. only a mind could do such a thing. Right. Lord, dude. I mean, you, okay, so you could you could you could define an, a mind in a way that anything that the, any form of selection from infinite cases will be defined as a mind, and if you do that, then yeah, whatever then whatever process whatever led to us having these rules and not the other ones. That would be a mind, but like, is that really what we mean by mind? That's not what people mean by minds when they're talking about minds. And you know, that's not the, that's not what when people are trying to communicate with each other and talking about minds. That's not what they're referring to. Again, you could play play with words until your god is real, and I will like, and yeah, your god is real. Fine, I could call my cat a god, and now god is real. But again, people don't we use words in a way that we could effectively communicate with each other and your way of using words are, is different from the rest of us. The, the, well, and, and that's the thing is like what you just described is just a fine tuning argument. It's just like the universe is, is perfectly designed in such a way to allow for X, Y, Z thing for physics, for life, for, you know, whatever you pick your favorite, it's, it's, it's the same thing all the time. And because it's set up in exactly this way and it could easily be any other thing, therefore God. It's the same argument that we get where like, oh, well, if the, the earth was farther away or closer to the sun, then, then life wouldn't exist. And therefore, God made the earth just like us. You've just expanded to the whole universe. The universe wouldn't exist if the laws of physics weren't in this way. Well, how do you know? I, I, I don't mean how do you know the, the laws of physics, because that's obvious. I mean, like, how do you know that other universes out there don't exist with different laws of physics 
and that it makes sense in that universe because it's that universe. How do you know that this might not be the only way that the universe could possibly exist? So the fact that it does, it just has to be this way. How do you know that the laws of physics don't are some crazy transcending thing that are beyond time and space themselves? And that's what you call God now. Like you're you're just picking like this one detail and you're saying, all right, this is where I'm going to put my my flag and this is where God lives. And there's just no reason to do that. You're taking what we know about the universe and you're saying, okay, this is how it is. But because of that, also there's this bonus supernatural extra thing. And there's a dude who lives on a little throne out here in this magic world. And he made all the, all the things we know, he made that happen because he's a space wizard and he can do that. And it's like, there's just no reason for it. You're, you're just adding all of this extra baggage and dead weight to what we know about the universe in order to try to explain it when you could just be learning it and trying to explain it. I, I just don't understand the purpose of what you're saying at all. Um, I don't know, man. I'll, I'll, I'll leave my thoughts there because I feel like we've been talking about nothing for 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't necessarily tell you that there are no other. <laughs> no, um, no, I just meant to say that the argument wouldn't necessarily tell you that there are no other universes. It, it just tells you about what we know about this one. And just generally. Right. What do you. Laws of physics. In we, general, know, like the, the we know the laws of physics more or less for this universe. What does that tell us about a supernatural entity existing outside the confines of space and time with magic space powers? Does it tell us anything? Well, the. the Okay. Um, the laws of, of physics, for example, are what you would call an algebraic structure. And I not do, dude. More generally, a syntactic Listen, structure. I tell you what, man. We, we've been on for 25 minutes, and Thank all you. we've gotten so far is like things look like they're designed, so they probably are, which is what I was worried this call was going to be at the beginning. And you were like, no, it's not that. And then you said exactly that like 30 times. So um, I'm on other shows where we have a lot more free time. If you want to call me on Skeptalk sometime and hash this out a little further, I'm happy to. But we have a set amount of time on this show, and, and we've got him. It's, it's 25 minutes. We've got absolutely nothing. So I'm going to move on to another call. I do sincerely appreciate you calling in. And you know, please, let's, let's try it again sometime and really try to hammer down exactly why this God hypothesis is necessary, because I just don't think it is. All right. Uh, <laughs> what a roller coaster it's I mean, been. I'm uh, not trying to be disrespectful, but when I heard William no, Dembski, he, he, and I'm a guy, I we just I, I just narrated the audiobook of Dr. Abby Hafer. She's a zoologist and human anatomy professor and author of a book called The Not So Intelligent Designer, where she's going through all of this supposed intelligent design. And there's a lot of that sort of all lots of information, complexity, et cetera. And she goes through and dismantles some of the some of the big things that are just poorly. If they were designed, somebody called the manager. And I'm actually touring with a speech uh, throughout the country and in Canada this year called Seth Andrews versus God. Who is the better intelligent designer? Because I could do a, a hell of a lot better than Yahweh or or beyond that. I, he he said omniscient and om, omnipotent or omnipotent. And. Invoking Dembski makes me think he had a specific God with a proper name in mind, which is what happens. Mm -hmm. They start with the nebulous deistic watchmaker, first cause prime mover, and then they take the chasm size leap into their pet deity. But I think to myself, all right, well, right now we're just talking about a deistic uninvolved. Like you just set the thing, you spun it, you let it go. Well, I'm not interested in that because it's not interested in me. And if, and if it is, uh, so trying to be personal or trying to prove itself through design, then I want to know about some stuff. I want to know about blind creatures with eyes and deaf creatures with ears and nipples on men and wisdom teeth and the appendix and a son that gives us cancer and, <laughs> you know, degenerating eyesight. What is it? Dembski and Ken Ham and uh, Stephen, I don't know if Stephen Meyer does. They all wear prescription eyeglasses for vision correction. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these people who are telling me that the eye is perfectly designed have to have science come in to intervene so they can freaking see. So I heard a lot of that going on. But if you're talking about design by the omnipot omnipotent and omniscient, he's going to have to do a whole lot better. That, to me, nullifies the argument right off the bat. 
poor design if it's designed somebody call the manager and i'm going to issue a complaint kind of thing so yeah that's it's just really it's so frustrating to like hey this call isn't about this is it no it's actually about exactly that let's talk for 25 minutes okay oh, i had a guy on my show like years ago and, and he's like he he actually said these words he said i have an argument for god i'm sure your your listeners have never heard and you and I are already going, oh, yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Not because we're omniscient, but because we do a lot of this and we see that mm -hmm. religions aren't coming up with anything new. I say, fine, uh, fantastic. I get them on the show. It's the same shit. It's the mm -hmm. same shit. It really came down to it's not a religion. It's a relationship, which I ask oh, him, is God. this going to be a religion relationship argument? Nah. And then, you know, two hours later, that's all he had. It was so frustrating. Well, that's, that, anyway. that's, I feel like, I feel bad because I don't want to be a jerk and sit here on, on camera and be like, oh, you're I talking about that. But like, please yeah. understand, like to, to the people watching out here, like, this is our jobs. And that exact mm -hmm. argument in thankfully so many fewer words has been presented 10 bazillion times. And it's just, it makes it's a weird as much no too. sense. You want to serve the caller, but at the same time, you're also serving a much, 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 much wider audience. And we weren't even in the esoteric at that point. This was like a <laughs> Deepak Chopra. We had gone right. off into the, the metaphorical substrate and we're wandering out in, you know, the cosmic, uh, you know, hmm. lobster bisque. Yep. <laughs> just somewhere it was i was gone i, I just checked out i'm yeah. sorry about that i just couldn't stay no you're you. fine My you're fault. just fine what what i think what i think that people need to recognize is that when the old model used to be we don't understand the process at, at which pre things came about so therefore god and now the new model i mean not new to you guys but the new model is like let's look at now that we understand the process let's look at the process and see how we could figure out how to call the process God. Let's look mm -hmm. at the, the play with words enough and look at the process as scientists have figured out or scientists and philosophers are describing and uh, just play with words enough to just be able to make God the process. And yeah. a lot of people listen to that, this, 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 gym, you know, this explanation of this. And because there's a lot of science involved and there's also a lot of, uh, play with the definitions of word it sounds sophisticated because it's using scientific te terminology and philosophical te terminology and it looks a lot more advanced than the old like i don't understand this for god and now that the scientists have done the work and they understand it like okay let me use that language let me use that complicated language and figure out how to confuse my audience in a way to make them seem like well okay god is this god has a mind god has free will let me massage the words free will mind god um choosing enough to fit the process that the scientists had, had are explaining to us how the universe works and how it came to be and if i could mad if i could bring these two close enough voila i have god that's yeah. the trick that, that's what this what's happening and what's so frustrating about that is that like they that's not the god that most people believe in when they call us most people who call talking about a god they're they believe in a literal person a a, a, a more or less human looking guy probably a big white man with a big white beard and a big white robe on a big white throne floating around in the sky you're watching you masturbate and judging what kind of shellfish you're eating like that's what people really genuinely believe in and so when these people call in saying, like you said, yeah, well, if I can you know, massage these words enough, then I can get this thing that's close enough to kind of like some sort of, if you think about it this way and you squint your eyes real hard, it's kind of like a God and like that. And then they say, see, this makes sense. Therefore, literally Jesus Christ. And like it's that, I, I forgot which one of you guys said it, but one of you guys pointed out as well. It's like this guy wasn't just calling about some deistic kind of esoteric like spinoza's god of like oh well the orderings of the universe kind of seems to have a pattern to it this dude i guarantee if we had let him go on long enough would have been no it's not it's just that it's it's this god and it's not just this god it's this version of this god in the church that i go to in the bible that i like and it's like that it's such an insane stretch and it's this little linchpin that we're trying to say well if we can just get this little bit then all the atheists will be able to understand all of this insane dogma from my specific religion i just i don't get the point i don't get the connection i don't get how it's useful it, it makes so little sense to me i don't know man uh but hey 
Uh, two things. Number one, smash that like button if you want to have Armin massage your words. Uh, and number two is uh, this whole call has been a case study in how bad of a host I am because we forgot to do the question of the week and the super chats. So I'm going to do that next. Uh, this is my real job, y'all. Um, we've got, uh, 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 before we get started is what the document says to say um so before we get started we have the question of the week a little share your experience thing that we've been doing uh where we ask you a question you put your comments down in the comment section um and then that that it, it, it tells you it tells us what to say here on the show um so last week we asked you complete this sentence it was really cringe when god blank uh and we got three responses number three was uh it was cringe when god populated the world with a woman and her two sons what a moral story. Uh, another one, uh, it was cringe when God forbade us to be gay, but told everybody to get intimate with his son. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of things about foreskins in this story. There's a lot of dick stuff in this story, uh, a lot of stuff, but it is. Uh, and then the last one, God's weird obsession with foreskins. Hey, I actually didn't read that before I said it. It's quite uh, possibly the cringiest thing I can imagine. Yeah. I, I hadn't read that before I started talking once again, terrible host um the prompt for this week if you're interested in participating is complete this sentence it's a bad idea to blank at church seth and armin what give me some prompts what, what's it's what's a bad thing to do a bad idea to do a thing at church uh i defer to my iranian brother what, uh, what's a bad thing to do <laughs> in church um hmm. discussing how much fecal matter is in the holy water there's gotta be a lot idea. there's gotta be a lot yeah yeah, there, actually, there. Nobody <laughs> cleans the poop out of the holy well. There's a study, and there's. <laughs> there's... <laughs> it's like shopping carts. You know what I mean? Nobody cleans the all poop of the out things of the I cages. expected to hear in that moment. That is just not. I need a moment to prepare myself. For what I'm <laughs> I think for me, you said not it a good idea. Be, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's not, it's not really, a, it's really more of a straight answer. Um, but raising your hand to ask a question. And the reason yeah. I say that is because somebody said on my, uh, Facebook page just yesterday, I think that every church sermon should be followed by Q and a, like there should be people like us in the audience going, well, hang on just a second. And so, you know, raising your hand to ask a question in an environment that is fostered to, you know, where you're a sponge and you receive from the good shepherd as a sheep. I think raising mm -hmm. your hand would uh, would be the one that the, they would consider taboo and I would consider to be necessary. I was going to just say think, but no, I like your better. That's 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 way better. Uh, we also have a great many super chats. Uh, one from Rainbow. Wait, wait before you dollars. Before yes. you go, the reason why the re my I, I thought a lot of people uh, knew why I said that. I, I, apparently, they don't judging by the live chat. The reason why I said that because there was a study done, and it showed that eighty six percent of holy water includes fecal matter I, I didn't just that was not just random that I came from the pe people dip babies in it people put their hands in there of <laughs> other unwashed filthy <laughs> hands walking into that church people don't wash people don't I'm wipe right that, people that, go touch the, the whole army is to be on a bunny trail that I'm going to be on all night <laughs> not so to I'm mention sorry, this, you go ahead breeze, <laughs> after the show fecal <laughs> matter oh, <laughs> bad time it's a bad time yeah. uh, oh my Rainbow. god <laughs> Yeah, you found it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Seth Talk amongst yourself. <laughs> what you got to do? Yeah. Five dollars from Rainbow Wolf. Uh, why don't parents' rights groups care for the mention of uh, uh, care care for or mention the rights of children, such as the right to not be rejected, abused, or bullied for being queer? Yeah, dude. Thank you very much. Uh, we were talking before the show about Save the Children, amazing organization. Check them out. Um, Robin Rinsler sent $10. Hey guys, remember it's not gay if it's in a three-way. Are you talking about what's happening right here? Because I feel like the fact that we're all dudes kind of negates what you're saying. Also, like, don't knock it till you try it. Uh, and then also we've got a Dragon Fairy member for two months sent $2. Uh, what's your favorite theistic argument and why? Um, uh, man, I got to hand it to you. Look at the trees. It's still funny. It's never not been funny. It'll continue to be funny till the day I die. What do you guys think? 
I'm sorry. I was reading about the fecal matter, and I just I totally lost the last <laughs> two sentences. <of> you. <laughs> No, I mean, Armin just cracks open a truth egg on me like that. You can't expect me to not immediately dive in. I'm sorry. I'm going to refocus on the show, but I'm posting that shit on the Thinking Atheist social media pages. And as soon as we're done here, that's information people need to know. Smash that subscribe button to learn more about literal holy shit. (laughs) God. That's awesome. Well, you know, it's it's funny. It's like when COVID was going on and they had to take the holy water out of all of the Catholic churches or most of the Catholic churches for fear of contaminating other people and spreading the mm-hmm. virus. You know, and I think the faith is filled with those types of practical preventions, which actually negate the idea of the holy, uh, you know, the supernatural protections around divine water, this holy liquid that is supposed to be consecrated from on high. And then they, they can't, you know, they can't leave it out because it will become infected with a very worldly virus. And so, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's funny. Holy water does have great utility when it comes to debunking bunk out there. So thanks to Armin. He's led me down a different <laughs> path tonight. Yeah. New bunny you know, trail to follow. It, it makes a lot of sense because they've been calling it holy water this whole time. They just never specified which hole. And now we understand a little bit better. You know what I mean? <laughs> Good night. <laughs> and that's our show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. God. I did not expect that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we got uh, two uh, dollars $2 from Isaiah S. Uh, mythicism for the win. Uh, Blind Limey sent five dollars. Hey, but Jamie's up in here. Uh, hey, Forrest. Hi, hi, Jamie. Uh, what's the is that a furled a furled flag behind you, or is that a LARP boffer sword? I'm really hoping the latter, my friend. You're in luck. It's both. Um, I've got uh, uh, so many things back here in the corner. This is a furled flag. I use this uh, to to unwind behind me for streaming purposes when I need to be all hilariously patriotic. Uh, there also is a, a, a sword or two. Hanging around back here, little, little, little LARPy things. Uh, I've got some didgeridoos and a wizard staff and a cane, uh, some wasps. There's all sorts of cool stuff back there. Uh, welcome to the treasure trove that is my office. It's it's a magical place yeah. full of wonder and and, and mystic uh, uh, whatever bullshit. Um, thanks so much for being here. Don't send any more of your money. You already donate your time. <laughs> um, uh, everybody uh, go watch uh, Jamie the Blind Limey shows, by the way. He's great. Uh, we got another uh, $10 super chat from RAT. Uh, it's, it's, it's R-A-T, but it's all in caps. Uh, uh, Armin, <laughs> Seth, and Forrest, I think, <laughs> thank you all for being here. I truly appreciate all that you three do for the community. A uh, little uh, face. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you pronounce the face away. I'm just going to call it Greg. So uh, thanks for all you do for the community, Greg. Uh, Forrest, do you have any cool RAT facts? Uh, they're the best, uh, double Greg. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of them. Uh, rats have some really cool studies on empathy and on tickling behavior. And I love that. Um, uh, number one, rats will go out of their way to free their compatriots, uh, from cramp conditions, even at the cost of food rewards, they will, uh, they show like empathetic, like pain. If you inject one with a chemical that gives them a stomach ache and they kind of like writhe and squirm around their cage mates will also writhe and squirm around showing like they're like, Oh man, that really, you know, they, they kind of show these empathetic pains and they do it more the longer they've known each other. Um, and also when you tickle rats, if you, if you give them a little Gucci goose, they'll, you'll, they'll run over to be tickled. They love it. Uh, and if you record it with a microphone, a super sensitive microphone and slow it down, it sounds creepily like a human laughing. Uh, it's great. Um, so yeah, cool rats, man. Rats are awesome little dudes. I read, uh, this is just recently for, uh, I, I do a second podcast called tree stories and we were doing, um, uh, a general knowledge or a trivia show and that mm-hmm. uh, rats are studied to help uh, treat or deal with autism because rats can be autistic. I did not know that. So Yeah. Yeah. They're, it's really cool. And that's one of those things. It's, it's such a, a burgeoning field of research. Like we still, there's like a hundred different genes that are associated with autism. And we have no idea like how they work together or what goes on there. And rats are an amazing source of research for that. Uh, you see that? I played along, but I contribute <laughs> to the scientists hosting the show. You are welcome. <laughs> you are welcome. Triangle of Stars sent uh, uh, 11 euros and 99 euro chunks. Is it pence? Is it cents? 
I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, 12 theoretical dollars uh, from Triangle of Stars. I'm so happy to see my favorite host, spelled with a U with favorite, uh, all together, even though I was slash am an atheist my whole life, you guys still find a way to convince me more and more. Thank you for that. Thank you for watching. That's very kind of you. Less Than Lucid sent $5. Valentine's Day is over, uh, so time to kick back and relax because it's a romantic awareness week. Uh, we A-Rows are all valid with or without a Valentine. You know what, though? If you're here, then uh, you got a whole community full of people who will be your Valentine. Uh, Miranda Rensberger sent $5. Balsamic vinaigrette and extra croutons, please. I had, Oh, the, the word salad. Got it. I was going to be snide and glib about it. But yeah, no. I um, love that. Uh, howdy. I slapped my microphone. Howdy sent a dollar and 99 cents. Secular humanism leads to animal rights. Discuss? Question mark. No, thank you. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have anything to say? <laughs> That's a whole other show, man. That's a yeah, whole. I, you I, talk about a rabbit hole. I, yeah, but... yeah, literally. Yeah. I I agree to a certain extent. There's a reason why we don't, you know, literally just torture animals, and and why we have you know animal rights and protection laws and things like that, and why we have uh, humane, uh, supposed to have humane killing of animals for meat processing purposes and things like that. Uh, that should be paid better attention to. Um, but that argument can go in a lot of different ways. Some of them crazy, some of them not. So uh, that is a whole other show. Well, One what? of the most horrifying things I think I've ever heard is uh, the way that uh, Islamists deal with meat and the slaughtering of meat. I mean, our, not, I don't want to go down that road, but I, I, it does It does speak to if you have if you have a value system that honors life in that way or at least wants to eliminate mm -hmm. suffering, then that's, yeah. that alone would be a great reason to go after hardline or fundamental Islam. Holy shit. I mean, I could not believe it. So. Wow. I, I would argue that animal rights are human rights because animal cannot create rights. So if there are any animal rights, are there are the rights that humans gave them. So secular humanism empowers humans to create more rights, including hum animal rights. So that's why hu secular humanism could lead to animal rights. I, you know what, rights. though? Credit to you. That is an argument that I've never heard before. So that's interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Blind Lime, he sent another $2 to say, holy water, it's the shit. Love the callback. Um, uh, Monkey at Typewriter sent $5 to say, uh, here's some money so Armin can uh, massage my diction. I'll show myself out. Uh, hashtag this man wants to dissect my boy. Stop it. I'm never going to live it down. <laughs> this person... Uh, was in a, a Patreon stream with me asking about raising a child with one parent who was an atheist and one parent who was religious. And while I still don't remember it, I am a hundred percent convinced that I told him to dissect his child because that is absolutely some shit that I would say. And I, hashtag this man wants to dissect my boy uh, is the best hashtag to appear on this channel, period. Uh, oh, wow. So welcome to the show with, with Forrest. <laughs> guy making things weird <laughs> since 1992 um and guess what an hour into the program we're ready for call number two <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh and i've got more announcements that we'll get to eventually we've got rj uh pronouns he him uh calling him colorado a little while ago we did a uh um a a poll in the in the in the, the super chat there or in the chats uh we asked what kind of call you wanted us to take uh and we talked about do you want a, um, an evolution call or an apocalypse call or a jesus did this or that call um and uh over 50 percent of you voted that you wanted an evolution themed call and that's what we got here rj wants to ask if evolution is real why haven't spiders developed wings um so let's bring them on rj you were on the atheist experience how are you doing today i'm doing okay so I got to ask, uh, you? the question you asked here, is this a, like, is that the funny way to say it or is that your actual question? Yeah, but I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's kind of a serious question because, I mean, if you believe in evolution, you believe that wings evolved, correct? Wings evolved on insects and it, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of different insects relatively easy from what uh you know some of uh the evolutionists claim uh but it hasn't happened to spiders and there's quadrillions of spiders around the world and there's uh you know there's a, a lot of reasons why they would have to why developing wings would be very beneficial to spiders right sure so so a couple of questions here 
Um, do you consider yourself to be a, a, a hard worker? Yeah. What do you do for like what 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 work do you do? What job do you do? Uh, well, right now I'm not working, but uh, I was I was a truck driver. I've been in a lot of different things. Okay, so so <clears throat> professionally speaking, your skills are in truck driving. Is that fair to say? Uh, well, I mean, right now I was only like maybe a year. Uh, I was in the military for about twelve years. Uh, well, I was just uh, saying, yeah. like, what 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 would you say is your professional expertise? If you had something to put on a resume right now. Uh, a lot of things. I was tech support. Um, I don't, you know, truck driver. You know yeah, how we'll, to drive a truck. We'll, Let's we'll just go with start that. there. Yeah, we'll right, go with I'm that. Sorry. So, so sorry, my I question to you then: this like twelve years, Tr truck driving. Okay, truck driving. Yeah. So okay. we'll just say the question is: if you're such a hard worker, then why aren't you mm -hmm. doing glass blowing, and why haven't you taken up heart surgery? Because you know we need more glass like, to to run you know, on your truck. Your windshield's made of glass. You, you need glass blowing for a lot of things, and we need more heart surgeons. So why aren't you doing those things if you're a hard worker? Mm -hmm. Well, I, could, I mean, truck driving pays really well. I mean, if you if you own your own truck, because it doesn't fit your life, right? Like Three hundred thousand a year. What's it that? doesn't fit your life. It does. It doesn't fit your life. It's not what you're good at. Uh, it's not what you want to do, and so you don't do it, right? I mean, I guess, I guess you can make that argument. Yeah. Right. The, the, the same I, reason I, I, that you are not a coal miner, the same reason you're not an airline pilot, the same reason you're not a fireman, the same reason you're not an astronaut. It doesn't fit your life. It's not what you want to do. It's not where you're happy. So you don't do those things. You do the other stuff you do, right? Okay. So when we talk about biology, when we talk about evolution, we can look at an individual niche uh -huh. for an organism kind of the same way. And this, this runs the risk of having people believe that individuals evolve, which doesn't make any sense. But just for the analogy, please understand this is an analogy, is that you, you've got spiders and you've got flies and you've got birds and you've got worms and you've got coral and you've got octopi and you've got all these different things. The reason why there isn't so much crossover between this whatever pick your favorite characteristic that they have is because it doesn't fit their niche it doesn't fit the way that they live um it just so happens that spiders actually do have some really freaking terrifyingly cool ways to travel through the air but that's neither here nor there the reason why i haven't sprouted wings and learned to fly the reason why humans don't do it is because our niche doesn't call for it the, the, the there isn't selection pressure to force us to evolve in that direction so we don't and we haven't um, and it's the exact same thing with spiders or or coral or, you know, flatworms or fish or pick your favorite, any other thing. Wings evolved independently, separate times in insects and in birds and in reptiles and in mammals. It evolved completely independently, separate times because the selection pressure on these different types of creatures called for that. But it hasn't happened to spiders because they don't need that to happen because they have good ways of air travel without it. and Otherwise, the ones that don't travel through the air, through web, weird electrical things that they do, um, don't need to. So there's really just no reason for them to have wings. And so they haven't evolved them. And that's the long and short of it. The same reason that you're not a heart surgeon. If you you, you don't need to be. That, even if you're looking at the terrain, that they're, they're in um, really, really high terrain that they have to cross, you wouldn't think that that would help them out at all with catching prey. There are some spiders. There are a lot of spider species that can use electrical currents in the air and literally propel themselves on a bit of web and pretty much fly through the air for like miles for a long way. So they have a different way of doing it in those situations and mm -hmm. it's just fine. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not really convinced, but I, I'll go ahead and move on to the next question. I, well, hold on, because I, I saw Armin had something that he wanted to throw out there. Okay. Armin, I, I can't hear you, bud. Sorry about that. Uh, can you? Okay, so I want to try to do a cost-benefit analysis with you. Uh, like, what when it comes a spider, like if it had wings, why would that be a positive thing? Just, this is an obvious answer. Just tell me I'm quickly. Sorry, why would that be a positive thing? Yeah, just tell me. Like that's yeah. positive because. 
to catch prey and to evade and predators. Run away. Yes, exactly. So those would be the benefits. Can you think of any costs? Costs where um, uh, let's say you have wings. Spiders have wings. Would it? Would, what would be the cost? Are you are you saying the size? Like the size, the weight of yeah. it would be. So it have. Yep, yeah, it will have extra. It will have extra weight. And you, yep. No, you will have extra weight. Okay, the physical structure might not be optimal. It might be in the way. You know, right? It also will require more energy and resource to maintain it. Right? You would have to eat more. Right? Because you have to pay a cost for it as well, right? Everything that is added to your body, you have to maintain a bigger diet, you know, more calories, more protein, more whatever to maintain it as well. So it's not having wings is not just purely benefits. There's a cost and benefit. And given the limited resources, right, it's not a question about what, what would be a good thing. Given the limited resources every animal has when it comes to the ability to, you know, capture resources, nutrition, protein, calories, the question is what it would be the best thing to have, not what would be a good thing to have. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. But, uh, I, you know, okay. I, there's a lot of insects that can fly that are large, like moths and wasps and bees and stuff sure. like that. But and, I see where you're going with and, that, yeah. And lots of them share a common ancestor that was also able to fly, and so they just stayed in that niche. They, they, they kept that it costs what, what, what Armin's ex explaining here is something uh, they call the extensive, uh, expensive tissue hypothesis. Basically it's, it, it takes energy to grow a new kind of tissue. It takes time to develop this new kind of tissue. It takes, you know, a, a lot, a lot of generations, a lot of mutations, a lot of energy to change the body in such a way. So it doesn't make any sense to just say, you know, what, what you're describing here gives some sort of intentionality to evolution, and, and it doesn't have that. You know, there, there isn't a time when a spider is going to like, oh, man, that's way over there. I wish I could fly there. Guess I better evolve, right? You know what I mean? That doesn't really work that way. Um, there has to be steady selection pressure for a certain thing to happen. Um, and like I said, wings have evolved several times as eyes have evolved several times, as, you know, the ability to breathe air has evolved several times. There's lots of times where we can see something evolving independently over and over. But in every one of those cases, because the same kind of selection pressure is being applied to these different species and they're finding their way into a new niche that works for them. So for spiders to evolve wings and, and you know, flip off into the sky, they would have to be sacrificing the niche that they're already really well suited for. You talk about catching prey. Lots of spiders are ambush predators. They're going to hang out with the web and they're going to wait for something to fly into it. Trapdoor spiders, they bury themselves underground. Tarantulas aren't going to be having an easy time flying around. They're, they're very terrestrial things, even like arboreal tarantulas. Do you know what I mean? It's just there's so many things there where they're already so well adapted to where they are. They don't need to change. And so why would they? Hmm. Yeah, but over such a long period of time, like you guys claim it's some of these animals have been around for millions and millions and millions of years with quadrillions of them being born with so many mutations. Mm -hmm. I, I just, yeah. yeah, I think you would have a lot, lot of speciation at that point in time. But we do I, have a lot of speciation. We don't see new limbs and new appendages just popping up de novo just because that isn't how it works. Can I ask a like, question real fast? Just a lay person, not a scientist. Can well, I ask a question? Yeah. RJ? Yeah. Do you believe then if the spider was not evolved, do you believe the spider was created by a creator? Yes. Is that creator like the Christian God or how, how would, yes. does it, does that creator have a yeah, name? Yeah. Okay. You're a Christian. Yeah, I'm, I'm Christian. Okay. Yeah. All right. So do you feel like it's reasonable that a benevolent God would create a creature that would sustain itself by shoving its fangs into another living animal or insect, liquefying its insides, and then sucking out the insides to sustain itself as the prey animal or insect dies horribly. Does that sound like good design to you? Insects don't have nerve endings. 
and they don't yes, they do. their brains i'm begged to differ the way we can no. process it no okay all right to, hang on you can ask for it so yeah, they, let's absolutely. say that let's say one of these predator spiders like the african but, they call it a bird-eating tarantula well, but whatever mm -hmm. it, let's say it's not an insect there are animals not insects with nerve endings and the designer's plan is to have the spider plunge its fangs into the flesh of a prey animal liquefy its insides and suck the insides out killing the prey animal does that sound like benevolent, benevolent wise design to you? The curse of Adam, the curse of Adam. So the, okay, the, so, the so came through Adam. The act of the rebellious Adam. fruit munching by two garden nudists yep. are the reason that spiders have to plunge fangs into other creatures to survive. Is that what you're saying? Correct, death entered the world through Adam. There was no death prior to Adam is what the Bible claims. So an act of rebellious yeah, fruit like munching that. by two cosmically conjured garden nudists are the reason. That's right. the reason that spiders have to suck liquefied internal organs out of other creatures to survive. I understand that? That is oh, oh, that, oh. that's correct. That's what it, it says. Right. Yeah. No, I, I have no I have no further questions. I, I have no idea what it's, else to do with it. Okay. It it just sucks. <laughs> Basically, I, I, so first of all, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to put a thing in here from this is from the Entomological Society of Canada, a little thing about do insects feel pain? Uh, there's also I'm not I, I could dig for it, but like I'll put that in the chat. Um, there's also a lot of cool okay. studies that came out a couple of years ago that shows like memory and, and things and in insects like they have a rudimentary nervous system sometimes, but like that. To, to say that they just don't feel anything doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but uh, the the whole thing, I think that, you know, what what Seth and I both are driving at, number one, what you're talking about isn't how evolution works. Um, and the alternative is, yeah, it's, it's messed up and stupid because of this ridiculous, corrupt moral system that doesn't make any sense. So, like, no matter which way we slice what you're saying here, it just doesn't track with either morality or reality. And I don't see where the disconnect between us is yeah yeah i was just i was putting that as a uh as a uh, argument against evolution I'm, I'm not sure where you're going with it but that that's the reason i came up with the argument i but you, gentlemen you, uh, you so rg what that. you're saying then is i guess i was gonna move on to this other Everything that works optimally in nature that is not does not cause pain or distress, right? That is that is not a destructive force. That will then be God's pure design. But everything that works suboptimally or does cause pain and distress or waste or whatever, that then is going to be the product of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden and the infecting of humankind with sin throughout the generations. Am I to understand that correctly? So the good yeah. things God, bad things fall of man. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's what, yeah, that's okay. what it says in the Bible. So, <laughs> is there any way to falsify that in your mind? If, if anyone points to something that has gone awry in this design, God's master plan, all you have to do is say, well, that's not God's optimized master plan. <coughs> you are ostensibly off the hook. You see the problem we have with that, right? Well, I mean, if you don't believe in God, yeah, I mean, I, I would see the problem. But, I mean... If I, your great, 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 great grandfather got a parking ticket... Do you feel like that would be a great reason for spiders to stick their fangs into the flesh of prey creatures, liquefy their organs, and suck them out? If my grandfather got a ticket? So, somebody down the family tree my, in your ancestral line did something that was kind of a, forgive the play on words, a garden variety transgression. Not rape, not murder, not torture. They did something like eat a fruit, jaywalk, whatever. Do you feel like it would make sense then to say, well, now 
other animal uh, animals that are not the human animal must now go and horribly prey on each other with pain and screaming and blood and, and death. Do you feel like that would make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, if well, I'm not God, so I would say that you know that's up to God. <laughs> But would you design it that way? I'm curious. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. If it's an if if everything is perfect, everything around you is perfect, and there's one rule that you just got one rule. That's all you have is one rule to follow, and you break that one rule, despite knowing that death is going to enter into the world, which is what they did. Then yes. That makes sense. Can't let this go. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I know we're on the clock. Long, but there's no, no please. Tiny beard. Yeah. Go ahead. So what you have is a father figure who creates imperfect children. He puts temptation directly in their path, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, directly in their path, which is the equivalent in this scenario of tossing a live hand grenade into a nursery. He then gives his arch nemesis direct access to those imperfect and vulnerable children, and he does and says nothing as they are tempted. They do something as innocuous as eating a piece of fruit, and because of that, there are billions in hell, and spiders sink their fangs into the flesh of prey animals, liquefying the organs and sucking them out. Is that what I'm supposed to buy? You know, the the snake they they're not sure if that's actually thing. There's a uh, dispute on. I don't that. care. I don't care. But I don't care much... if it's uh, Truman Capone. I don't give a shit who it is. It was but, a but, tempter, but, but an like agent said, of Lucifer. Imagine you're given everything. You have everything on the planet that you need, and there's just one rule, and you're like, no, I'm gonna break that one rule, even though I got everything I you, want. You're an imperfect creature. Let's say you're tempted and make a mistake. You may, you are tempted and you made a mistake. And you aren't just punished in the extreme, but billions of people who had no choice, but who had no say in their own being born are also punished. And all of the animal and insect kingdom, all life is also punished as well. You don't see why I might have a problem as seeing that as reasonable, especially from a perfect God who could do better. He could do whatever he wanted. Isn't that fair? Just because you don't think it's reasonable doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just Can I also ask a question? You don't uh, I'm done. Agree no, with. no, no. I'm sorry. And I've monopolized it long enough. Thank you for no, your indulgence. No, dude, I, I you. loved every second of it, and I hope you keep going. I just had a, a separate question that I thought was was functional and could add to this rj uh does god know everything yes it, it, has that always been the case has god always known everything that has happened will happen all things forever god is all knowing completely yes so then he knew that we were going to rebel in the garden we he knew that we were going to eat the fruit and that he was going to have to punish us and all these things were going to happen so you have a child. Do you have any children? No, I do not. No. Okay. Have you ever worked with children? Uh, no. Have you ever been a child before? Child. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yeah. I have, yeah. That's, yeah. So, like, when you're a baby, when you're a little kid, and you have no idea how big the world really is and how what consequences are, if a little infant crawls across a keyboard and hits the button that launches a nuclear missile, do we need to punish that baby for the devastation that it's wrought? Or did it just be a baby? Was it just being a baby and it did something accidentally because it had no idea what it was? What do you think is the moral solution here? If a baby does something wrong and has right. no idea. You're right. I mean, I want to... I want to punish the baby. And now especially, we're, yeah, you wouldn't because that would be a stupid, monstrous thing to do, right? So here's God, and God puts humans in this garden. Humans have no understanding of anything in the entire world. They literally don't know what evil is because they haven't mm. eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil yet. They don't know <laughs> what wrong is. 
and God takes the thing that they're not supposed to do. He could have put the tree in another goddamn garden, but instead he puts it right in front of them and then allows someone to tempt them and knows the whole time because he designed it this way and is all knowing I'm going to do this. They're going to eat the fruit and then they're going to be sinful and I'm going to punish them. And then that happens. And he goes, how could you do this to me? Ah, I must now punish you. Like, do you not understand how that's a completely brainless, not only immoral, but just stupid thing to do? If I get in my car and the fuel gauge says I have 10 miles left and then I try to drive 100 miles, I can't be pissed off when my car runs out of gas. I knew that was going to happen. And here we have God who takes people, makes them not knowing what evil is, knows that they are going to do something evil, gives them the ability to do the evil thing, makes sure they have the temptation to do the evil thing, and then when they do the evil thing that he knew they were going to do, not only punishes them, but punishes every living thing from then on throughout all history. That's insane, that's stupid, and that's monstrous. Tell me how I'm wrong, RJ. You read the Old Testament, it's amazing to see how often Yahweh is surprised. Explain, uh, yeah, seriously. But, let, well, are you going to let me answer? Or are you gonna... No. Okay, Go ahead. Okay. No, we're kind of just laughing at it now, but by Go all ahead. means, answer. Okay, so just, just because a, a being is all-knowing, that doesn't mean that people don't have a choice. So, yeah, the God Oh, my knows. God. Oh, that, the choice. Make the wrong choice. There's also a parallel. It? So RJ, RJ, if I if I videotape a football game, those people had the choice, mm-hmm. but I still know how it's going to end because I have it on videotape. So if I then watch the videotape and I say, okay, here's I don't know football teams. Here's the Bulls versus the Octopuses, and I know the Bulls are going to win. <laughs> but if the Octopuses lose, I'm going to punish them. They have the choice. They they played the game. They had the choice, but I already knew the outcome. Does that make this situation any more fatuous or any, or I should say any less? Insane. No, because you, you're not controlling the, uh, you're not overseeing the football field. You're just watching a video of a football field. Like, no, you're right. Actually, that does make it infinitely worse, RJ. You're absolutely right. God also controls everything and could change this easily at any time, but chooses not to. The point of all of this, what Seth and I have been talking about, is that based on what you're saying, God intentionally makes some people in order to send them to hell. The purpose of it is for people to go to hell and be tortured forever. The purpose of it is for life to be bloody and brutal and violent and short. The purpose of it is the cruelty. How does that not sit weirdly with you? That he doesn't exist. That doesn't prove that. Oh, no. Yeah, you can we'll get there later. Morally. We'll get there later. We sure, can... we'll grant that he exists. If he exists, he's a monster. That does not prove he doesn't exist. We'll get That's not what Faris is saying. That That's how yeah. Faris is not even telling you that he doesn't exist. Faris is telling you how monstrous this God of you is if it existed. If your God is real, he's evil. Uh, you're... And you're confusing the term of all knowing because all knowing could mean he, the the person still has a choice. He could go the other way and say, "Hey, no, I'm not going to eat the the." That's not what you said. What you said? Could nope, he- that's not what you said, R.J. What you said when I and I asked for clarification. I said, "Does God know everything that has happened, will happen forever? He knows every possible thing." And you said, "Yes." So. He already knows the future. Whatever free will you have, he knows what choice you're going to make. And he's still going to punish you for it, even though he has the ability to change the circumstances and show you something better. You are a child. You don't know what you're doing. And he knows, and he's going to punish you for the things that you don't understand and you don't have control over because he designed it in a way to make sure you did not He orchestrated the situation you're born into and then punished you for it. He made you broken and sick and commanded you to be fixed and well. And if you don't do it, he's going to torture you forever. What kind of God does that? You see, you're you're saying he doesn't exist because the morality 
because he did. No, I'm not. From He's moral. not saying that. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to Forrest? Are you are you are you watching a different show? That, that, Forrest that, is not even making exactly what you're saying. You're saying I don't agree with him. He's not saying he's not even making an argument for why God doesn't exist or not. It's not even the topic. That's not even the topic. I don't know what you're listening you're, to. You're, you're trying to say to me that this is an immoral God, right? Is that yes? What, what are you trying to say? Are you yes, to say he's an immoral God. Or, Okay. Let's yes, say your I, God exists, Forrest. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I I don't believe your God is real. I'm saying if he is real, assuming he is real, he is evil. So he, let's take it at face value and say your God is real. Since, he's evil. So since he didn't do what you wanted him to do, he then he can't be real because he doesn't agree with what you would. That's do. not what he didn't. He didn't do what any moral person would do. It's not about Forrest. It's about any person that understands what good. Like, would you do that? Forget Forrest. Forget Forrest. Would you do that? In your in the atheistic universe, morals don't exist, right? Oh That's I'm not sure. true. We're not, we're not even talking. To you. He's not remotely interested in answering RJ, the question. Yeah, RJ. It's, so I both Seth and I have been giving you our and our our breakdown of why we disagree with what this god has done. None of us have argued whether or not it exists, and none of us have talked about atheistic morality or any of that. And rather than just directly addressing what we're saying, you're jumping from point to point to point to point to try to find something else to argue about. We're about to end the call. We're we're, we're not letting you leave this. If your god is real, then what he's doing is wrong. It's immoral and it's evil. If he's real, he's a monster. Address that or we can move on. I disagree with you. That's not true. If I tell you, if I have a kid, if I have a kid and I say, hey, you know, you uh, don't stick your hand in the oven and he does it anyway. Am I the one that's wrong or is he the one that's wrong? Oh God! If hang you on, have a kid. hang on, Forrest. Hang oh, on. Yeah, Hold on. I can't. I can't help myself. Hang on. Yeah, please. No, RJ. Say the same thing I'm about to. RJ, do you believe in in hell of the New Testament? Depart from me, you who are cursed into a lake of everlasting fire. Is there a is there hellfire? In the Book of Revelation, it, it talks about hell. Yep. Okay. Do you believe in hellfire? Yeah. Okay. If you had a child or a uh, brother, sister, parent, friend, whatever, who had done something heinous, who had made a, a mistake. And I'm not talking about an innocuous thing, eating the fruit, the parking ticket, jaywalking. But what if they'd done something really bad? Is there any scenario where you would go up to them, douse them in gasoline, and set them on fire? No, because I'm not God. Okay. Okay. You would not do it because you feel like it would be the wrong thing to do. It would cause immense suffering. You're not a monster. You would never torture someone, murder them in that torturous way. You yourself, you're grieved by the idea. You would never do it. Is that fair? You're a moral person. You would never set another human being on fire to die in that correct. way. Correct? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. All I'm asking you to do is to give yourself permission to apply that type of moral standard beyond yourself. If you heard that Allah had done it in the Quran, you'd be grieved. If you've heard one of the Hindu gods or one of the ancient gods of the Greek gods had done it, you'd be grieved or you'd sort of brush it off. Ask yourself if Yahweh deserves the same standard. And if you're not willing to say, well, if it's immoral in this context, why would it not be immoral in that? Ask yourself why. I think this is a this is something I would like you to pursue in your own life. Why would it be horrifying and tremendously immoral in this context, but appropriate and just and even holy in another context? Is that fair? Just chew on that tonight. Right. That that's correct. But that's why there is a salvation to get away from that. That's why. Look, if the person threatening me with fire wants to save me, that's not salvation. That's extortion. You can perceive it. it, it Love me or I'll burn you. That's on you. That's not salvation. 
That's extortion. Ex that the definition of extortion doesn't fit that. But uh, if you who want made to hell? Make that claim. Who made hell, RJ? Who who created, designed, and implemented hell? He created it for the fallen angels originally, but yeah. Okay, so if it's for the fallen angels, then I would not ever end up there because it's for the fallen angels. But then it, it also is for the, the people who turn against him. Okay, so then it is for me and you not know, just the fallen angels. By the way, it's also okay to burn fallen angels, but now I'm involved. Okay. So the person or the deity, rather, who created the scenario with Hellfire is saying, love me, do these things, accept me under these conditions, or I will throw you into Hellfire. That's not salvation, RJ. That's extortion. Mm. No, you're, the word extortion means you're... Uh trying to get if you look it up in the legal term it doesn't mean that but i see where you're going with that but uh just chew on it tonight just think about it all right get away from me get away from I, all of us I, I, I and think about it. I, I understand okay? give yourself okay. permission a lot of times we think well he's god he can do whatever he wants we're just insects under his boot we have no right to ask these questions or to demand a moral standard. You know, we are mortal, he is immortal. We, who, who can know the mind of God? And we are told that we're not qualified to ask moral questions or have moral expectations of a divine deity, whatever. But I wanna just have you chew on that and ask, why shouldn't I have, why shouldn't I give myself permission to hold any and all to some kind of a moral standard? And I think that's fair, okay? Okay. Okay. I got. I got you. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I was going to talk about my second portion of it, but we. It looks like we okay. used up a lot of time. We've but, had you for a half hour, buddy. Yeah, I think I'll, we better. We better call it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fine. I'll. I'll call thanks. in a later time. I guess. All right. Thanks. thanks. Sorry, I, I, care, I, RJ. I don't mean to like, I, I'm supposed to be the squirt gun. You guys are the machine guns, but this is something that just gets under my skin. It's whenever I yeah. hear people say, well, it's really our own fault. And whatever he does is moral because we're ants in the ant farm and we're here for his amusement at his pleasure anyway. And free will, I, he didn't say free will, but he, he there was a free will shade and it just, it just mm -hmm. sets me off. So apologies no, for I, jumping in there so much, guys. I appreciate no, it because no, no, honestly, I, otherwise it would have just been me explaining evolution the whole time. Because like that's that was super prepared to break down like neo Darwinian evolution, but like honestly, I think it was much more important to get to where we got to. to, to well, I mean, like, Armin hey, could have done I, just as good a job as me. I just feel like I was I'm sitting on the edge of my chair going, "Okay," <laughs> and I'm leaving from one point to the other. Okay, but no, no, I, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Before we move on, I just want to make uh, two points. First of all, the audacity to tell three atheists who are saying that they don't they don't think it's okay to torture people for doing things that was not their choice, for, for things happening that was not their decision, torturing them is not okay. And you, as a Christian, saying that it's okay, and then at the same time saying, atheists don't have morality. I mean, if- Did he say that? I think he that morality, that, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he did yeah. say that. Like, <laughs> I mean- I mean it, No, <laughs> has no morality. We knew that, but I mean, the rest of us are pretty, we're okay. We're centered, I'm just saying. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you think torturing torturing people for eternity for things that they had no say in, if that's morality, okay, yeah, I don't have morality. I want to call what we have something else. You keep that morality for yourself. You know, I mean, I, I will, just like a, a spider with wings. Once you get him going, you just he just he you can't stop him. He's on top. I, I will say, Seth, you were you were a lot more charitable than I would have been because there was one part of that you said, you know, would you if someone committed some atrocity, would you set them on fire with gas? Gasoline, and his answer was no i'm not god and like yeah. that hit me so you were kind enough and charitable enough and handsome enough to say well, <laughs> actually you know it's i think you wouldn't do it because you think it's morally repugnant and you would be grieved by that <laughs> thought right and he was like oh well yeah i i wanted to lay into him on that just like how could you possibly say no it's okay because god did it uh, to, to, to fun, any of that so much of that you know whatever god decides to do we're his creation, so he gets to do it. There is no immorality in any mm -hmm. behavior, any thought, any 
any consequence. As if God yeah. does it, it's by default. It is de facto moral. Mm -hmm. And this sort of, I think, surrender of ethical thinking, this surrender of values, this desire to really be a slave, to say, well, if he tortures me, if my child dies in a car accident, or if my my loved one gets cancer, or if some some horrible thing, if I if I die in a house fire tomorrow, yeah, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Whatever he does, it is righteous and moral. It's a type of slavery that grieves me, and I'm desperate to see people liberated from that kind of thinking. Yeah, no, I, I think we can all agree on that. I think that's why we're all here, because it, it really is just... It, it's soul crushing to see yeah. somebody defend that and to embrace that in their own lives and to assume that if something bad happens, they must be the fault of it. It's, it's because this fallen world, the sin and all these things, you know, it's something we've talked about in the show a few times, you know, he's smarter than me. I'm, I'm so stupid. He's stronger than me. I'm weak. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm this little insignificant thing. He's so great. He punishes me because I deserve it. He's yeah. just challenging me and testing me. He's putting me through these trials to make me better. Uh, he, he loves me. That's why he hurts me so much. He, he only causes pain and suffering because I deserve it because we deserve it. Everything I just said is talking about an abusive boyfriend. And yet, when you slap a, in a, a Bronze Age sex manual around it, it, you call it a religion. And like that, to me, it it really just blows my freaking mind to, to say that I have to sit here and walk people through basic human decency and say, yes, you can apply that same standard to the God that you believe in, like you were just trying to do with RJ. You I would never ask do these evil things. Why would you be cool with it when God does it? I wanted to ask RJ if it would be moral if Yahweh had us drink an eternity of feces, holy water, but I didn't get around <laughs> to that part. Right? I wanted it. That was in my queue, but I didn't get a chance to get that. I, I hope RJ calls back because I want to know, like, is, is there anything that God could do that would be bad? You know what I mean? Like, I want to know what his, but, what his thoughts are. First, it's interesting because you're talking about basic human decency because unlike what religious people claim that – religion gives you morality it seems like it's it's one of the only tools out there that could take you so far away from basic human decency like it seems like without it a lot of people would not come up with these crazy conclusions like it's really hard to come up with these crazy conclusions unless you're religious that it yeah. seems like it's actually the only tool that could get you this far away from that's, actual morality that's why we're here, y'all, because if somebody can make you believe absurdities, they can make you commit atrocities. And so, like, we're here to, to talk about it. I We get so many comments like, why do you care what so much what people believe? And I, there's a, a clip that I think was on TikTok of last time you and I were on the show together, Armin, and somebody called in and said, why do you care what people believe? And I was starting to talk and you just scream in the microphone, because your religion's <laughs> affecting our lives. <laughs> yeah, dude, <laughs> you get it. <laughs> Yeah, and somebody asked me, well, if you're not a Christian, why do you talk all the time about Christianity? And I'm like, or fundy religion. I can't remember how they phrased it. And I'm like, well, yeah. if, you know, uh, why would people who want to defeat cancer talk so much about cancer? It just is yeah. such a non-question. Well, when the religious stop talking so much about me, maybe we'll find something to to, yeah. to shut up about. But like, as it is right now, you know, it's, it's you know, atheists homosexuals and uh, everybody everybody who doesn't fall in line that's all that they can think about and that's all that they want to legislate uh it's it's deeply frustrating uh but i gotta tell you uh one thing that i'm very excited about is these announcements that i need to read um if you like what we do uh please consider uh supporting us on patreon you can give a uh, giving to our patreon ensures our ability to continue to produce the content that you love this this can happen with your support. Uh, visit tiny.cc slash Patreon AXP. You can also become a channel member for as little as 99 cents a month. Click the join button down below the video, and that'll give you access to special chat emojis. Drop those emojis in the chat right now so people can see them, uh, as well as early access to YouTube shorts and clips. Uh, you can also buy a limited edition T-shirt. Uh, uh, are you upset that AXP challenges your religious beliefs? Maybe you should pray for them to stop. That's... That's a lot of language on one shirt, but hey, you can buy it if you want. Uh, Eva, you can get your purchase uh, before it goes away at the end of the month, so so try to buy it now before it goes away forever or until they want to bring it back. I don't know. They, they'll do what they want. I'm not a cop. Um, uh, we also want to send a big thank you to the crew. Before we move on, the crew are the people who make this whole thing possible. They put this show together every week. They put in their blood, sweat, tears, brains, everything into making this whole thing happen, and it's awesome. Um 
So thank you so much to our audio operators, our video operators, our notes and timestamp takers, our mods, our call screeners, our uh, 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 TV at responders, all the all the people who do all the things that I don't understand. Thank you so much for making the show possible, and thank you to viewers like you for a sponsor for keeping the show alive. Uh, it's a super cool thing that you do. Um, we also have a bunch of super chats. And oh man, I didn't realize we had this many. Uh, terrible liar sent five dollars to say, if I remember correctly, as a former Catholic, holy water is blessed one day, and that same water is used the whole year round. So yeah, not surprised. Uh, Hell's bells sent six dollars and sixty six cents. Uh, say no to communism wine. I think they meant communion wine. Uh, but uh, I'll take some communism wine uh, as well. If you want to drink spa- uh, strangers backwash, no, you don't. Um, uh, Eric Martinez sent a dollar and 99 cents response to the relationship, not religion argument. And then that, that just cuts off there. I don't know if there was more or not. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, maybe they mediate something. I'm not sure. Sent $20 with no message. Thank you so many for so much for those, those $20, uh, X million, uh, sent $5. What happened to responses from last week's question? We did it already. I just did it really bad. Uh, Robert Irwin sent $10. I want to see Forrest white Anglo-Saxon Protestants uh, that he keeps in the corner of the flag and wizard stuff. You, they're, they're, they know what they've done. They can stay back there. Halo Master 1243, uh, who was a member for two months, sent uh, five Canadian dollars. Thank you so much for your colorful last dollars to say, oh my glob, uh, I love all three of you as hosts. Almost too much of an amazing thing. And all that uh, more... I'm having a hard time reading this. Almost too much of an amazing thing and all that. More Seth is definite need on the show for sure. Very nice. Thank you. And then the last time Seth and I hosted together, he sent me a text message immediately after the show saying, hey, just so you know, you need to slow down when you read the Super Chats. <laughs> you don't, tell so <laughs> don't tell them that. Don't tell them that. And it, well, he's like a Jack Russell Terrier. It was like there were no con- at one point there were no consonants used. He was just flying. <laughs> so I said, you know, you might want to, you know, take a Lunesta before you read I've the tried. super chats on the next. Show. <laughs> I've tried and it's so hard. I'm just from my brain goes faster than my mouth does sometimes. Ruben Manzo uh, sent two dollars with an A. Is it Armenian dollars? Is it Albanian dollars? Is it Australian dollars? Is it Aust- Australian? It's Australian. Okay, two ass dollars yeah. from Ruben Manzo. Sip from drink. <laughs> Spiders aren't insects. True, they're arachnids. Um, mm. Fuzro Hans sent five dollars. You guys helped me deconstruct twenty years of religious indoctrination. Jesus of Christland, dude, still working on it. But thank you for helping. Thank you for watching. Very kind of you. Um, Lenart Steinke. I'm gonna guess. Sent 6.66 euros. Still don't know what a part of a euro is. I'll learn after the show, or I'll probably just remember. Uh, but at this present moment, it's the blanket of my brain. And I'm not going to look at the chat, so don't tell me. Um, do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior, Anakin Skywalker, who will bring balance to the forest for real? Um, Corbin Redacted, uh, who's a new channel member, thank you very much, sent $5. Uh, which body part would serve spiders better if it became slightly more wing-like? evolution is gradual and needs to be beneficial throughout for sure um i'm gonna say the butt if they had a more wing-like butt they could they, they would do really well there uh ruben manzo sent 10 more ass dollars uh regarding the last poll i've heard many theists talk about seven being the most holy number as a mathematician i mm-hmm. could lay out exactly how unfriendly of a number seven is to try to work with that was the hardest one for me to memorize with my seven stables uh monkey at typewriter sent five dollars rj's argument if we come from monkeys why don't birds have thumbs <laughs> 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 truly the termites have gotten to the foundation here fun show fellas thank you very much for watching um x million sent twenty dollars it's cringe that the one and only god uh what does that say constitutionally constituently it's far away from my face and i'm also very stupid it's cringe that the one and only god constituently described as a trinity uh is a single unified entity who made mary pregnant refu- uh, resulting in his own birth doesn't mean he weirdly incestuously begat himself yeah it's 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 a whole thing man it's just uh, oh it's I a great verse in the new testament too when it actually says this 
where the, the angel told Mary, the Holy Spirit will come unto you. And I just thought, wow, that's just all they should be preaching every Sunday morning. All right. That's there there all is, should. there is a church within walking distance of my house that actually like in, in like the main amphitheater area, I was there doing a, a science show a little while ago because they didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says like something, something about how sweet it is when the Lord comes on you. And it's just like, <laughs> man, you can't, you can't just put that up there and not, like just I don't know, man. Just can't um, do it. Yeah. I would uh, pay quantum. for a video version of what Seth just said. Like, I would, but I think <laughs> that's your ringtone. You yeah. make that yeah. your ringtone, my friend. <laughs> quantum answers uh, uh, gifted ten atheist experience memberships. Thank you so much. That is incredibly generous mm -hmm. and kind of you. Um, D and D nerd zero six three zero sent fifteen of their dollars. Question everything, assume nothing, and the universe is yours. I always like to add in, follow the evidence wherever it leads as well. Um, and then finally, William Mattis uh, sent ten dollars. Three handsome atheists on my screen today is a good day. You got Seth and Armin. I don't know who the third one is, but oh, I'm sure Greg was up on screen for a minute. Um, with that, those are all the super chats we have right now. Don't send any more unless you want us to sit here and read them. Um, we've got, uh, we did a chat <laughs> poll and we asked what you guys wanted to hear next. And this is the line that won. Are you guys ready to keep moving? Yes, of course. Sick. Cool. We've got me, Kyle, uh, calling in from Georgia, pronouns he, him. I'm going to read this whole thing. This is what the call screen says. Why do atheists feel that Jesus is an apocalyptic preacher when he presented himself as a peaceful Messiah? Matthew 24, 30, 36 is the verse where it refutes Jesus being apocalyptic, but all that day, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So not an apocalyptic preacher, uh, but actually a peaceful Messiah. Uh, I'm going to sit this one out mostly because well, I have things that I want to say. That's a false Seth is going to just, just no, no, no. unravel Armin, his Armin whole brilliance. We're raring to go. Oh. I'm going to sit back and listen to the wisdom. Go ahead, right. man. Oh, you really? can see the hosts in line. This is the order in which we're going to be smart today. <laughs> We've got Mikhail on the show. You're on AXP. How are you doing today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm blessed. How are you? I, I heard some type of, like, noise. Yeah, I'm blessed. How are you? Good. Never had a bad day in my life. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, I I found it interesting. You talked about the butthole holy water. That's pretty gross. But um, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. So they really, so they really bless the holy water once a year, and then everybody just dip their face in it and their ass. No, no. no. Who knows? I'm not. I'm. I'm neither a Catholic nor a cop, so I don't. Forgive I don't me, know. brother. I'm on the clock. What? What is your question? Um, I wanted to talk about how atheists like Bart Ehrman keep on stating that Jesus, thanks to bad exegesis, is an apocalyptic preacher when he's actually not. He's a peaceful Messiah that presented himself as the coming um, kingdom of God. <laughs> and the eternal salvation of humanity and eternal Bart Ehrman. himself. Um, do you have Bart Ehrman's number? No, I'm just saying. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I've got a bunch of stuff to say about Jesus. None of it's relevant. So by all means, Ehrman, you, you kick us off. No, no, I have a couple of verses in front of me that shows um, Jesus was, you know, uh, 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 I always have a problem with saying this word, but like end of days Messiah, apocalyptic Messiah. But he, I have the verses in front of me. But what you're referring, what you're saying is a false dichotomy. You're saying the reason why he wasn't was because he was a peaceful preacher. Let's assume you're right. Let's say he was. But why can't he be both? Why can't you be? Could, could I not be? Um, claim could I not come and say like hey let's be kind to your neighbor be good to orphans and also by the way end of days are coming anytime like any minute now like what is what is the contradiction like for you for what for what Bart Ehrman is saying to be true Jesus just had to preach and believe that the end of days are coming and you saying that he was a peaceful nice preacher even if what you're saying is true it doesn't negate that like they could both both be true at the same time. Wouldn't that make it true? Would, wouldn't what Bart Ehrman is claiming be true if if Jesus was claiming that the end of days are coming? 
I mean, here, I have the verses. If you read Matthew twenty, uh, if you read Matthew twenty four thirty six, Jesus doesn't say the end of days is coming next Friday. He says nobody knows but the Father. If he was what Bart Ehrman says, like this guy who believes the end of days was going to come in about a few weekends from now, he would have said something like, "Oh yeah, the end of days is coming soon." Like you're going to, you're going to. Well, I have, break. I have is some it, verses. I have some verses. It, Do you want me to read them to you? Like I have some examples of the verses. Actually, I mean, many. I mean, you can tell. Yeah. You can tell. You can tell me the verse, and then I'll, I'll, I'll probably know what they are. Okay. But uh, if you want, okay, so is it is it contingent? I'm sorry. I I just I I I'm kind of just annoyed that like you if I say the end is coming near. Do I have to give you the date? Is 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 him being an apocalyptic preacher contingent on him saying this is when the world's going to end? Because he's very clear that the world's going to end. So if you're going to say, well, yeah, but he didn't say when, so therefore he's not talking about the apocalypse. I don't know, man. Seems seems kind of weird to me. I'm going to hear Armin's verses. Hold on. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. So I will give you. I, so Mark I, Mark there just said. Let me okay. Go ahead. You go. You go ahead. Go ahead, and then let me just give you some examples. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me respond to what he just said. Jesus didn't say the end is coming near. Like you don't need to buy a camel because the camel's gonna die regardless. He says that nobody knows but the Father. If he was an apocalyptic preacher like Bar Ehrman thought or what Paul the Apostle thought, he would have said, oh, yeah, the end of days is coming next Friday. It's coming soon. You're not going to have grandchildren um, because, you know, the world's going to be destroyed. God's going to come with his army. He's going to kill all the Romans. He's going to make sure the world is controlled by um, the chosen people, you know, stuff like that. I was about to no, he just said he just <laughs> said that the people who follow me will not taste death before the world ends. But hey, really quickly, yeah. it's, it's about six thirty. And Seth, I understand you had a hard line, but you had to get out of here. Uh, you, forgive me, yeah, I'm already a little bit over. Um, what you just so said. I, so but, me, I, but but I do. I I think you, know, you and Armin both speak to right right. Christ told his disciples, some among you will not taste death. Also, we're operating on the premises that we have proven Christ and that the writings about Christ and the Gospels are all accurate in four wildly different and conflicting Gospels. So the, mm -hmm. is he an apocalyptic prophet is actually not the question that we start with. I think we have to start over here and go, was Jesus, like, is there proof of Jesus and Jesus as God? That's a whole other conversation. I will leave right. to you gentlemen who are much more smart than I am smarter. <laughs> See, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> and I'm going to go and take care of some family obligations. And then I'm going to go Google holy water feces and then call it a day. <laughs> I love you both. And I thank you so much for allowing me to play along tonight. It's been a real yeah. honor to be here. Thanks, guys. It's always awesome to have you, love my you, friend. Seth. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Love you, Seth. Uh, see you later. Bye. Seth Andrews, everybody. What a bang up guy. Uh, yeah. So anyway, there's, there's, there's three people saying things. And then Armin, I believe you, you had a couple of more verses you were going to. Yeah, so, really so, so no, Mark 13, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, right? In, in these passages, Jesus speaks, uh, directly about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, signs of the end of times, the coming of the son of man and the need for, uh, vigilance in anticipate in the anticipation of these days right and the language and imagery are consistent with jewish apocalyptic literature of the time such as the book of daniel so that's and in mark uh, 9 1 right um the coming kingdom jesus is quoted as saying truly i tell you some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of god has come with power right and this statement has been interpreted to suggest that Jesus believed it, the apocalyptic transformation of the world would occur within the lifetime of his followers. And then we had uh, parables and teachings. Jesus freq frequently used parables with apocalyptic themes, such as the parable of the weeds, which is Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, uh, and the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew uh, 20, verses 1 to 13, to describe the coming kingdom of God, and the separation of the righteous from the wicked. So you can see, like it's a like this is the guy that was 
obsessed with talking about the end of times. Like, I think that would be good enough to call him an apocalyptic teacher. Like, now, if you want to say that he's not because he didn't come up with a specific date and mind, like, say, like, hey, next Tuesday by five o'clock, there will be the end of days because he didn't say that. He's not, you know, what Bart Ehrman is saying he is. Okay, well, you, then you have a different standard for what's an apocalyptic preacher. Most scholars, given this person's obsession with talking about end of times, will categorize him as such. All right. So could I talk? Like, uh, are, are you are you yeah. done with, with the whole thing? Um, so I'm going to respond. What a rude way to say something to somebody who just explained their position thoroughly <laughs> and thoughtfully. Yeah, please, by all means, indulge us with your wisdom, sir. But, but, uh, but I, I don't mean to be rude. Jesus calls us to be nice and kind to unbelievers. And I'm sorry if that uh, that ca that came off as rude. It's just that I'm talking through a phone, and I don't know when you all have me muted or when y'all have or when I can actually be heard by the audience. I didn't mean to come off mm -hmm. as rude. I'm very sorry if if fine. words came off as rude. All right. We good? Um, but yeah, responding to what you just said, the verse where it talks about uh, some of you will not taste death until uh, um, in which you see the coming of the kingdom of the Lord, that's talking about the ascension, and that's talking about when Jesus met Moses and, um, and, and the prophet. So... If you actually read that uh, that verse after, like the transfiguration comes after that verse, and it comes in all three of the gospels, that's what it's talking about. It's not a coincidence that all three of the gospels have the transfiguration after he makes this quote, except for John. Jesus said the coming of the kingdom of heaven, not the coming of the kingdom of the apocalypse. Like I get if you read like something like Rev. Res, uh, uh, the revelation of John and stuff like that. Revelation of John reads like Jesus is an apocalyptic preacher because he literally says that the apocalypse is coming soon. Um, why are you why are you so hell bent on Jesus not being like okay? So either he is or not. What why what's your point? So do you think that this is an attack on Jesus? Like there are many better points. He, Jesus could have been a great dude and think that the end of times is coming like soon, or he could be a great dude that he didn't believe any of that. He could have been a horrible person that believed that, or a horrible horrible person that didn't believe in that. Like, what is this? Do you think like do you think like Jesus is being attacked by saying that he's he was an apocalyptic teacher? Like you're saying he was nice. He was not talking about the end of times. Like as if like as if. That's people are attacking him by calling him that. Well, let me. What are you trying to get at? People say that Jesus. People say that Jesus was a failure because, like Joseph Smith, who said that the uh, apocalypse was coming soon, it was going to happen. Just like, uh, but uh, and uh, he was in an environment. Okay, here's the thing. Your interpretations are probably wrong compared to Bart Ehrman because Bart Ehrman takes into account the environment that Jesus was in. And he was just repeating and reflecting a lot of end of times narratives of people like around him in that environment. People were obsessed. Like he lived in a time that people were obsessed with talking about like, hey, any day now, any day now is going to be the end of times. And he was right in the middle of it. And he was repeating things that those other people were saying. So it's like, I can see why scholars would think like, okay, like, yeah, his beliefs were influenced by the environment that he was around, that was around him. This was counter his time. Jesus was a rebel. It's like saying that baptism yeah. in which Jesus. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, that doesn't that doesn't negate what I said. All a lot of these other apocalyptic uh, preachers were also rebels. Like that was the point of being this. Like they they were they were like rebelling against the religious authorities at the time by saying like, "Hey guys, end of time." That was a vehicle of being a, a rebel by saying, "Guys, the end of time is coming." Like, let's move away from the authorities and the mainstream and the people and uh, the powers that be. That was. That, that they were using these narratives as a way to be rebellious, and Jesus was not the only one. There were a, a lot of other people that were trying doing the same thing. 
It was the religious authorities at the time who were preaching the apocalypse. That's why they hated Jesus. They thought he would come as a warrior messiah instead of a peaceful messiah. You're, we had, we had like many when, he, when when he said, "I come bearing the sword and not to spread peace, but the sword," like that that whole thing. Part of me. You mean like when Jesus said, "I come not with peace, but with a sword," and and only he who hates his mother and father can follow me, and if you don't hate your family, you can't like that that whole warrior messiah thing. Because he did that too. He was kind of all over the place in the Bible. I mean, that's not uh, that's not a warrior messiah thing. That's more or less saying that you should put God first instead of your family, just like Jesus did. I mean, what? Yeah, the 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 sword thing. Let's try the sword thing then. No, no. I can make post hoc rationalizations too. I'm just trying to like draw some lines here to show you that like there's there's a lot of shit that he said in the Bible. I think what Armin's trying to draw out of you is just like, why does it matter? Like, what's what's the end goal here? Neither of us believe that Jesus is real, and I'm pretty sure neither of us believe that he was an all-around good guy. Like, there's a lot of things that Jesus said and did that I'm not a fan of. What? I also don't believe that he ever said or did them. But, like, here we are having this argument about whether or not he really preached the apocalypse. And I don't get how it's relevant or useful to anybody, especially on this show, where, where the point is to try to convince us this guy existed in the first damn place. And I'm telling you, he probably didn't exist. And if he did, I don't like him. And you're like, yeah, but he didn't preach the apocalypse. I'm like, okay, so what? <laughs> what? What are we doing? Actually, I just have, and, and also I just double checked, and it was a tool for rebellion. Jesus's end of days narrative and other teachings can be um, ha has been seen as a tool of rebellion against the religious authority by proclaiming an imminent a cop <laughs> apocalypse. And the coming uh, kingdom of God, Jesus po positioned himself in opposition to the established religious leaders and institutions such as the Pharisees and the, I don't, I don't know these other people, who maintain control over religious practices and, in, and interpretations. His message not only promised a radical reordering of the world, but also critiqued the existing religious um, and scholar uh, and social structures. In, you know, in general, these end of days narratives throughout history you could see like they come they come um, and it's not just in the middle east you could see that like in hindu uh, religions as well like in other ancient religions as well it's it's often used as a tool of rebellion and even if you see some of that narrative in the pre in the in the narrative in the you know myth of the authorities before the, the ones that you're rebelling against is because they also were rebellious to what they came before them so you see this coming time and like I see this come in, in Islam as well. And even during my time, I see that people use this in Islamic countries. And I think you guys see this in Christian countries as well, that people use this as a way to shake things up because they're not happy with what how things are. And they're basically warning everybody about this great big change that is coming and everybody needs to get ready. And you are the person or the people or the cult that provides you the tools and the methodology to prepare for this big change. It's a it's a very fantastic meme or tool to use when you are trying to rebel rebel against the authorities. And that's why you see it constantly being used again and again across different cultures and there, and across different religions. I just want to state that Jesus wasn't with ISIS. He wasn't like this big like guy who preached terror. Like he wasn't this guy he said that his kingdom is not of this world. He had a spiritual kingdom, he not said, a spiritual kingdom. He said, he said, I'm not here to bring peace, but the sword. He said, I'm, uh, you know, uh, you're not with me if you don't hate your mother. If you don't, if you, uh, if you don't, I, I come here to set the mother against the daughter, a father against the son. I don't know, like family members against each other. He told people that you're not with me. If you love your father more than me, or if you love your mother more than me, that doesn't seem like very nice and peaceful. He told, he cursed the tree because it didn't have fruits. He I was going to bring that up. Yes, God. Yes. He saw a big tree without fruit and is like, you'll never have fruit again. And just like, why? Who does that? What, what is the point? You know? Like, ah. Uh. Right. Yeah. And also the act of rebellion was not just against the, you know, the Jewish religious authority at the time. It's also a, a rebellion against the Roman, you know, that they didn't believe in the end of days at all. Um, you know, you know, when he, when he put the, those demons into the pigs and made them throw themselves off the, mm -hmm. um, the cliff, the, those pigs said, re, re, 
introduced themselves as legion, which is, you know, what how you refer to the Roman soldiers, which is basically an act of, it was like a movement, like an anti-colonial movement, right, against the Roman uh, authority. So it was, it was, it, the whole movement was a rebellious movement, and it had all the characteristics and the methodology that rebellious ideologies use. Like, it's pretty understandable how, why, and how it evolved in, and got the shape. It actually, it's actually very fascinating. Um, it makes religion more interesting. Like when you study religion from a secular perspective, it actually becomes interesting. <laughs> right. Guys, check out Bart Ehrman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody get Bart Ehrman on the show so we can address this. Yeah. <laughs> Do any of you have Bart Ehrman's number? I just want to know. Nope. Any of you have, I don't know who he is. Should, but bring him on this show, guys. Bring him yeah. as a co-host. And that's a great. It's, it's, thank you so much for. The, we all know <laughs> Bart Ehrman is just chomping at the bit to get on AXP. He's been dying to be a part of this for years. He should. He should be. <laughs> Maybe you could grow back your hair, but uh, but I just like to state that Jesus never said anything bad about the Romans. Dion. Well, except that pig, except that pigs one, except the except the pigs saying that we are legion. The demon throwing themselves yeah. legion, not Jesus. The demon called yeah. them legion, not Jesus. Yeah, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, but the story. Yeah, but again, we the don't story. we don't think that Jesus the like. Story. Yeah, we don't actually believe that Jesus said any of these things. I think the utility of the story okay. is to demonstrate, and again, that was a clever way because it might have not been very legal for you to be very direct about your anti-roman perspectives at that time so it's good to come up with a narrative and the pigs will just the demons in the pigs just introduce themselves as legion instead of like you like saying something anti-roman so directly i mean he wasn't careful enough he got crucified and in the person should have been more careful. not the pigs but read the story yeah i, I know up, i know but i just looked up bart ehrman and i yeah this is, i've seen this guy before that's all I have to contribute because this really hasn't gone yet. Oh yeah, Bart Ehrman. That's where I'm at at this point in the conversation because like, what's the actual point, dude? Like, I, I can't stress this enough. Like you you called into a show re run by atheists who don't believe that Jesus is real, trying to, you, like, the point of the show is to try to convince us that God is a real thing and that we shouldn't be atheists anymore. And we're talking about this stuff. We're trying to talk to, and, and your whole thing is like not only is jesus real but also he didn't say the things that not you think he said but some other guy said that he said some stuff and he didn't say that and like we're not that guy we're not affiliated with that guy we don't believe the things that you think are real are real and i don't understand what we're doing for 20 minutes and 25 seconds now do you um do you realize that most like people who actually study the uh the bible like most scholars agree that Jesus existed. Okay, yeah, but it depends that depends on what you mean by Jesus. The, it yeah, depends you, what you mean by Jesus. I mean, yeah. Do you mean Jesus like a dude whose name was probably actually closer to Yeshua who walked around and said some shit, or do you mean like yeah. the zombie that that fucking was killed and then rose from the dead and healed the sick and the blind and the blah blah blah? Like a guy existing doesn't mean that he had magic powers, doesn't mean that he was the son of a god, doesn't mean that there is a god for him to be the son of, doesn't mean that he was resurrected, doesn't mean that he can read your thought, doesn't mean that he watches you masturbate, doesn't mean any of the other stuff. Whether or not this guy existed as like just a person, sure, if you can convince me that's yeah. real, awesome. But there, there are lots of people who think that he probably did exist. Nito Bandito. No. There were also like 30 other preachers rocking around saying the same stuff at the same time. Apollonius said the same shit that Jesus did. There's people alive today that people believe walked on water and raised the dead and things like that. There's whole cults all over the world that you don't care about that say the exact same things. People exist and people say things. I'm I'm curious to know, is there such a thing as a supernatural creator somewhere beyond time and space that made the whole universe and gives a shit about what kind of fish I eat? Like that matters. But like beyond that, I don't know who this dude was or if he said things about the apocalypse, and I don't know why I should care, Mikhail. Well, yeah, we, we like to point out that Apollonius, Apollonius of Tiana was a person who was written a hundred years after he supposedly existed, 
and it my- wasn't a real thing. It was just an example of why I don't give a damn. Do you understand? Like, I'm not trying to like actually engage with you over like the 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 historicity of whatever random dude lived in the desert two thousand years ago and said stuff about <laughs> the sky. That's not my intention. I'm just saying that I don't have a reason to believe that this guy, if he existed, was magic. And if he was magic, then I don't like him anyway because he said and did a bunch of shitty things and like in the book. And if the book isn't real, then I don't care anyway. Like, just there's a million issues here, and you're like at the. I'm on step one, and you're on step like 85, saying yeah, but he didn't say anything about the apocalypse, and I don't, I don't get why. What he's trying to say, what he's, what you're trying to say is that Jesus was not ISIS. And I agree with you. Jesus was failed ISIS, okay? Jesus was trying to be ISIS, but he got caught before he could, you know, start. Like, the character of Jesus, not the real, like, I don't, nobody knows who that real, the guy that the scholars agree that was probably based on some dude that got crucified. I'm not talking about that. The Jesus that Christians believe in, that character, okay, that story starts with a guy who was trying to be like ISIS, but got caught halfway through the story and was crucified and he didn't succeed to, to become a successful. He was starting a rebellion movement and it was cut short. His career did not last long because the authorities at the time captured him and killed him. So he's fa- your Jesus is failed ISIS, not even ISIS. Jesus main goal was to cut people's head off because they won't convert to his religion. Cut people's head off. Well, I mean, he did. Uh, he, let me let me give you an example. Muhammad, Muhammad. Okay. Do you believe that Muhammad was closer to ISIS than Jesus? Do you agree with that? It's be upon him. Um, I'm I'm sorry. My phone my phone is a little faulty. Can you say the uh, question again? Okay. So Muhammad was did cut people's heads off. Okay, a lot of people's heads off. Okay um for for things that were not even crimes okay and he sold women and children into slavery so what muhammad did was pretty close to what isis uh, does today and muhammad before he rebel so here's a similarity between jesus and muhammad uh, Jesus rebelled against the religious authorities of this time. Muhammad also, the character of Muhammad, the story says that Muhammad also rebelled against the religious authorities of, the, of his time. Here's the difference. Uh, Jesus was captured and crucified and it didn't. the story didn't continue. Muhammad, they tried to kill him halfway through the story. They tried to kill him, but they failed. And he actually managed to succeed in his rebellion and he established a government. So with Jesus, Jesus' rebellion failed, Muhammad's rebellion did not fail. So there was a time that, that, you know, the night that they went and captured Jesus and then eventually they crucified him. There was a similar story with Muhammad. There was a night that they showed up at, around his bed to kill him, but he was not there because he figured out that they're going to do, do that and he ran away. So the, Muhammad's story has two parts, the, the Mecca period and the Medina period. Right. So the, the, during the Mecca period, when he was the, uh, still doing the rebellion against the religious authorities, he sounded a lot like Jesus. OK, he was a lot more peaceful. He wasn't t- talking about killing people or punishing them. But then eventually when he managed to establish his authority and he had his religious authority and his rebellion succeeded, then all of the narratives and stories and the commandments about chopping people's hands and legs and heads and torturing them and all of that that came later right so looking at how religions progress you know how the religious stories progress you know in ancient times and this is what you see you see like you have a much more peaceful narrative when you are rebelling against the authorities and then all of a sudden the narrative changed to you actually doing the violence and you doing the suppression of people when you become the authority. And you see what Christianity continued without Jesus. Jesus died, so he didn't do the, he didn't do what Muhammad did, but Christians did that for him eventually when they became the authority. Yep. Every bit of that that evil, that punishment, that 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 terror, the crusades, the inquisition, the witch trials, like every bit of that is fleshed out in real history that we can all agree actually happened. So could I ask you if Jesus lived up to his full potential, do you think Jesus would be Muhammad and he would start cutting people's heads off? He would have multiple marriages. He would have married a child. He would have uh, told him. Well, your Jesus Jesus is a fictional 
here's the thing. Your Jesus is just a fictional character, okay? Your Jesus is just like a character in a story, right? So judging by how other stories evolve, like this could go anyway because this is we are writing these stories. Humans are making up these stories as they go, right? So you're are you talking about how you what you're asking me is about the evolution of a story if it went a different direction. So judging by how other stories evolved, if the religious authority was given a chance to rule, I would guess that yes, that's what the direction of the story would have gone if he was given a chance. But if you, but you think you're ta you're asking me to judge a person, okay? But your character, the character that you're referring to, Jesus, it's not a real person. It's a fictional character in a story, and I know that his story is based on probably is based on a real event, a real guy, but it's so far away from that real guy because so much of it is made up that I cannot see these two people as the same guy. That guy, we don't know much about that other real guy. So this is so, so much, your Jesus is mostly a fictional character. So when I want to judge this Jesus, I cannot judge, I don't do the same judgment that when I, I don't judge a person's, like in real life, when we want to judge like Armin, Forrest, or, or you, we judge them differently than we, when we judge people in stories. But because when we want to judge people in stories, we think about the authors. We don't think what, about what a person would do, what a person with a certain history would do. We think about what the author would write if they were trying to get the audience engaged with the story. And then we will look at those authors and see what those authors, where they lived, what they thought, what their beliefs were, what the other authors around that time were writing, and what what you know what environment were they being influenced in? And we would judge the authors, not the actual character, and see what motivations did the authors have. Like why, like every single story, because this is a meme, this is an evolution of a meme, and it serves a purpose. So we have to look at the politics of the time. And like if Jesus did this, if you change the story in this way, it will say, serve one political need. But if Jesus said something else or did something else, he it will serve another political need. So that's why the, the judging a character in a story that is that is supposed to serve a purpose, a political purpose, is different from how we judge an actual human being outside of a story. That was all incredibly well thought out and erudite and very well spoken. I also just want to throw in there that one of your your kind of like criticisms or like, oh, you think Jesus would marry a child? Another thing. The story literally starts with God impregnating a child in order to create Jesus. So like, yeah, I kind of do, man. I don't know, man. It just, I, I don't get how you have this dude on this pedestal. It's so weird. Address what Armin said. I have nothing but frustration. I, I will derail this call. <laughs> Yeah, you already derailed it. You think the Virgin Mary was like twelve when she conceived Jesus, or at least the, the, the usual? I think. Pretty sure the academic consensus is between uh, fourteen and sixteen. Okay, um, I know that back then they would betroth women like very young, but they would usually marry them in their like early twenties because it took years for men to build up. A and what part, what part of that changes the fact that she got pregnant at 14 because God impregnated her as a child? That's a child. Where in the Can Bible, we agree that a 14-year-old is a child? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where in the Bible does it say that she got impregnated at 14? Especially yeah, uh, according to the Bible, she went cross country with Joseph on foot. Does that sound like can, a can, year old? Can we agree that a 14 year old is a child, Mikhail? Oh, yes, most definitely. Can, can we agree that impregnating somebody against their will isn't cool, Mikhail? Absolutely, but it wasn't against her will. God, it, it was through God. The, the angel just showed up and said, Hey, surprise, you're pregnant. They didn't ask permission. She didn't send home a consent form. There was just, hey, guess what? You're going to have a kid now. That's that's rape, Mikhail. You, do you? How is it rape when there's no physical penetration? Do you? Oh, my glob, dude. You did not just say that shit to me. <laughs> oh, that's so fucking gross. You really don't think that you think? Oh, I'm going to stop myself. Do you understand breathe, breathe that there's breathe, a, a breathe. lot of ways to sexually assault someone? Do you get that? 
Yes, but usually it has to do with action. Usually, who cares? The fact of the matter is, getting someone pregnant when they didn't ask to have intercourse with you is wrong. Yes or no? Absolutely. Okay, then we're done. That's the whole thing, is that don't fucking get up in here with your semantics when I'm saying the whole thing started because God forcibly impregnated a young girl when she didn't want it. She didn't ask for it. She couldn't have consented to it. He forcibly impregnated somebody, made it her problem, and now you're going to defend that and come after, oh, well, Muhammad married a child. Yeah, that was fucking gross, too. More than one thing can be gross. Okay. I mean, the so, way that myth- so then square the circle for me, dude. Was it right or wrong for God to forcibly impregnate a, a young girl, a virgin, by, by her name? Uh, this is a straw man question. He didn't forcibly impregnate her. Did he do it without her consent? No, it was with her consent. Okay, so when the angel came down and said, you are pregnant, that was that wasn't something that had already happened. He was lying. He said, he said, you will be pregnant. Read the story. I'm going to, I'm going to double check. Yeah, well, that doesn't seem to be any choice there, though, as well. You will be like, there is no, there's no way out of this. You will be pregnant. But yeah, right? while he's checking. Do you want to talk? Uh, do you want to talk, uh, uh, Ahmed or uh, Ahmed? Um, I, I don't know your name. Oh. Armin. Armin. Well, I, I'm I'm saying your name as if it's mine to give. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. All right. You can say my name. I'm sorry, I'm not on a screen right now. I don't know what uh, what people's names are. I'm familiar with your name. I have a very uh. Well, I have a very common name, but still. But um, well, Arvin, go ahead. Do you have anything to say? Um. Well, let's get back to Muhammad. So, when Jesus, when Jesus, uh, says to people like, "You must take up your cross," um, you must bear your cross. Uh, the Son of Man comes as a ransom for people's sins. You think that that was all lies? Like, you think that he didn't know that he was going to die? I don't care. I, 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 lies? He's a fictional character in a story. I, you could just... Here's the thing. When, when it comes to fictional characters in a story, uh, you're, it's flexible. It depends on you, right? Because if, if, the, if it's a character... Like, for example, let's say Voldemort in a story, right? Let's say in the, in the books, there's some of the thoughts of Voldemort is not specifically mentioned. And you ask me, Armin, what did you, what do you think Voldemort was thinking here? Right. Given that the book does not specifically mention what Voldemort was thinking there, I could play around with it. I could just decide like, yeah, I could decide that he was lying here because the book doesn't specifically say he was lying or being honest here. So it's up to me to decide to fill in the gaps. So, because it's fiction. So your Jesus story is also fiction. So if I think the story would be interesting if he was lying, then I could be like, yeah, he was lying. But if I think like, no, that would be so out of character. Um, it doesn't fit the rest of the, like, I'm like, no, it doesn't look good in the story. It would be more interesting if he was being honest here. Then I could be like, yeah, sure, he was honest. Like, I could go either way. doesn't really matter. Okay. It's uh, a fictional story. That Muhammad was a fictional character. Do you feel that um, that the whole story of Muhammad being in a cave and Gabriel coming to him and telling him to read, yeah. and then he, since he's illiterate, he can't read? And yeah. do you feel like that yeah. Muhammad is a fictional character? Yeah, that's also all, all fiction. Muhammad, just like Jesus, Muhammad's story is based on some guy that did something at some point. But a lot of the things that they attribute to him doing and saying, it was just made up during the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasty for the political needs at the time. So, for example, let's say a lot of the things that were attributed that, well, canonized and attributed to Jesus' story 
were very uh, they had a lot of utility for example for the roman empire at the time uh, a lot of the things that were attributed to muhammad saying and doing was very had a lot of utility for the umayyad and the abbasid dynasty at the time it, it served political needs it had utility it had political utility oh, muhammad, what's your point muhammad's a fictional character jesus is a fictional character is all major like religious figures just fictional characters to you like is buddha a fictional character buddha mostly yes buddha is also most made up but are. yeah most buddha is also like based on probably based on one guy yeah but this is uh, i don't know like, you want to go through the list but yeah here's what happens you know, like some event here's what happens here's what we know what happens we have seen what happens okay so some event happens that has a major impact on people and then it makes it into the stories of the people at the time they add uh, they take the you know common tropes of how stories are made in that environment based on those tropes they add to that person's story and then the story keeps getting added on to it more and more and you, you can see the progression it, every time we we managed to find enough evidence for the evolution of these stories we we saw how much more exaggerated the abilities and uh, of the of these characters uh, became in religion. We saw this in Hinduism. We see this in Buddhism. We see this in Judaism. We see this in Christianity. We see this in Islam. We see this in other many other Greek mythology. We see this in Roman mythology. We see this in Egyptian mythology. We see this in North mythology. So it, it progresses. It changes. It it uses the popular tr uh, tropes of you know the the way that people say the enjoy stories at the time and it take it, it, it remodels itself so there's two things that these stories there, there are two um rules that these stories have to obey for them to progress from one generation to another uh, and from one culture to another right there's two templates that they have to follow one one is what is the popular stories and myth that right now has gets the most amount of audience and engagement like what are the tropes that people enjoy listening to for example in modern times we like the cinderella trope right the cinderella trope is for a story where somebody starts off very poor and seems to be unlucky and then some somebody discovers them and finds something in, in them that is unique and all of a sudden now they're boom, better off and rich or like have access to a lot of wealth and power or something. So we, we like that trope. So you can see that many stories keep using that trope because it sells, right? So in different times and different cultures, different tropes sells. So that's one rule you have to obey if you want your story to, uh, to, to succeed. And another rule, and nobody does this consciously. This is like happens, it's kind of like evolution, right? It's kind of like, um, it's, it's just the, uh, is uh, survival of the fittest meme rather than the like the gene right and it just goes through uh one society from one generation to another without anybody like designing it from the top um and the, not, the next rule that you have to follow is that you have to serve a purpose so the authorities the rulers they will uh, you know subsidize or give money to the people or give power to the people that are saying the right the narratives and the stories to the people that serves their purposes the most and also they will suppress and execute or torture or punish the ones that are saying the wrong ones and this gives the signal to the storytellers which is we call them preachers or religious scholars that what stories are selling right now what's what and you as a storyteller which is a preacher or a religious authority you, so you have the ruling authority and you have the religious authority so you as a religious authority are getting two signals you uh, and you could decide to go the rebellious route or you could go the, the route of like i'm going to be loyal to the kingdom or to the authority and just get their patronage from them right and if you see that if you feel like there's an opportunity for you to go the rebellious route because there's a gap there's a gap in power there's a there's a vacuum in power and you might want to take advantage of that then you will jump on uh, the narratives that have are rebellious in nature but if you are thinking like no the people power relative to the authorities is not that much then you will jump on, jump on the narratives that the religious authorities want you to repeat and you will tell those stories and this is how religions evolve throughout culture throughout histories throughout time i'm gonna wait for a response for that and then i have some clarifications and some context about what i was arguing about earlier hold on 
Corrections, clarifications, and context. Hold on. Could I could I say could I respond to what he just said? Like yes, uh, yes. Just just. All right. So I just like to say that the that the narrative of Jesus Christ, instead of getting more glorious throughout time, it actually got gotten way humble. Most skeptics and atheists think that the Gospel of Mark is the first gospel in which it was written account of Jesus Christ, and it has 24 miracles. Now, the last gospel, the gospel of John, it has only seven miracles, eight if you count the resurrection. So not only did the narrative of Jesus get much more humbler, and the gospel of John, Jesus doesn't even exercise a demon. Okay, I'm going to let you... uh, uh, speak. I just wanted to say that point, but I'm gonna let sure. you speak. Um, I forgot uh, what the other name is. Jeremy, your name is Jeremy. Forrest. Forrest. Okay, Forrest. Forrest. Okay. Yeah. So I, I I have to correct myself first of all. I have correction, then clarification, then context. Um, so the correction is I was wrong about what I said about the angel coming down and telling Mary that she is pregnant. I had conflated the book of Luke and the book of Matthew there. In the book of Luke, uh, the angel comes down and says, you will be pregnant, not you are pregnant, like I thought. She says, you will be pregnant. Uh, and then uh, Mary says, how is that going to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm a virgin. And uh, the angel says, God's going to come down here and do stuff to you. And then Mary says, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let everything that you just said happen to me. And she agrees to it. Um, I had confused that with book of Matthew, where in Matthew one, he, uh, the angel comes to Joseph and says, this is going to happen. Mary's Mary's pregnant now, and this is what's going on. So I had conflated those two stories and I, I, I fucked up there. Um, so that's correction. Clarification is what was going on with those two books. The con- context I think is important. The reason why I still think this is a disgusting story is that even though Mary did technically give consent and say, okay, we'll let this happen. First of all, Children can't consent to sex. And I looked up this, this is gotquestions.org. It's a Christian, a biblical answer site thing. Um, and it specifically says, the Bible does not specifically state how old Mary was, but most Christian historians speculate that she was around 15 to 16 years of age at the time of Jesus' birth. Earlier on, you corrected us by saying, well, most Christian historians believe that Jesus actually existed. They also apparently believe that Mary was a child. So children can't consent to sex, regardless of what this angel said and regardless of whether or not she said it's cool. It's still fucking gross. Also, there's this thing that you need to learn about called a power dynamic. There's a reason why prisoners can't have sexual relationship with guards, even if they all consent and agree to it, because one is in a position of power over the other, which still makes it rape. So you have now God himself saying, hey, I created everything. I have complete control of the world. Also, are you cool with us fucking? And she's like, I guess. And also I'm a child. And here we are trying to say that that makes any of it okay. It fucking doesn't. This is a disgusting power dynamic, and she is still a kid agreeing to have a kid, and that is fucking weird. So I was wrong about what the story says. I am not wrong about what the story implies and how disgusting it is. Can I also uh, clarify something? Because you, uh, uh, Mikhail, said something that is not... Wait, 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 wait. He has something to say. Yeah, yeah. Armin has something. Yeah, because you said something that, like, throughout the Gospels, throughout time... Jesus became less fantastical, and I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not right. And I checked, and yeah, it's not right. <clears throat> so the portrayal of Jesus becomes increasingly elaborate and miraculous as one progresses from the earliest gospel, Mark, to the subsequent gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John. This development reflects the evolving theological perspec- uh, perspectives of the early Christian communities and their context. Mark, right, so let's go from the first one and then go down the list. Mark, believed to be the earliest gospel written around 70 AD, presents Jesus in a relatively restrained manner, focusing on his teachings, healings, and exorcism. Miracles are present, but are described in a, a straightforward way. Then we go to Matthew and Luke, written later, expands on Mark's narratives, including more detailed birth narratives, the nativity, and additional miracles and teachings. These Gospels were written to 
address specific community needs and theological questions, which may have influenced their more embellished accounts. Then we go to John, the last of four uh, canonical gospels and written around 90 to 100 AD, presents a significantly more developed theology. It portrays Jesus not just as a miracle worker, but as the in, in, incarnate word of God, emphasizing his divine nature more explicitly than the uh, synoptic gospels, which are Mark, Matthew, and Luke. John includes more abstract theological discourse. Uh, for example, I am, I am statements that presents Jesus in more explicitly divine light. So you're wrong about that. Jesus becomes, Jesus goes from being a man, a, pr a preacher to all of a sudden, like becoming a better and better miracle worker to all of a sudden becoming God himself as it progresses from one gospel to another. Okay, okay. I just want to hit up two points because both of you said a lot of things. One, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to be called Mr. Forrest or just Forrest, uh, run for Forrest. Forrest is just my name. I'd just like to say thank you. Just Forrest? Yep, that's, that's my name. Just Forrest? Okay. I'll just call you Forrest. Okay, so Forrest. Oh my God! I call just me. Move on. <laughs> move on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. This. I, I, I don't know how you I, I identify just as Forrest or just Forrest, but I just like. It's my oh name. Oh my God! My name is Forrest. Just, it's fine. Let's my spend another. How about how about how about we spend another twenty <laughs> minutes uh, discussing whether or not we should call Forrest just Forrest <laughs> or Mister Forrest or other Here. like. Do you want to? Do you want to like check you. other alternatives? Do you want to go through a list of ways that we want to call? Do you want to make it public? I, I'll go by Forrest. You can also call me Chef, uh, Fleet Admiral, <laughs> Funk Master, or Crunchwrap Supreme. Continue on with your point, sir. <laughs> okay, Funk Funk Master Supreme. I just like to say thank you. In a lot of these discussions, it's very hard to admit if you make a fault because a lot of people feel like. Uh, they're insecure and they can't make a, they can't uh, give like the opponent, like some leverage in saying that they're wrong. I can appreciate that because I actually studied the Bible. So I know a little bit, I know a little bit, not, not much, but a little bit. Um, I don't trust God questions ministries because they never give a citation to many of their studies or support. So that's one thing. Number two, okay. the link where it says that that Mary, the Virgin Mary, was like sixteen or whatever. Like they have many store, they have many stories. Which one? Um, another thing, another thing. Um, do you? I get that you say that there's a power dynamic, dynamic, dynamic. I I can't talk right now. There's a power dynamic when it comes to God in a human being, but would you feel like it would be different if she was like 29 or something and God came to her and be like, Hey, would you be cool if I impregnate you? I mean, at any age, we're going to be a no. dynamic. It's like, yes, it's no, I would not feel any differently about that thing. You are correct. It would be gross at any stage. It's really fucking weird that I'm having to explain and clarify the rules of consent right now. Oh, no, you don't. I'm just clarifying your... I, I'm just getting some clarity for me because I agree. It's very weird, like, at any age to see the uh, leader of the universe come to you and be like, hey, uh, could I, uh, uh, like, you're my prophet. Hey, you're, I'm, I'm going to f like find a way to put my son in you and stuff like that. Like, it's like if a billionaire comes up to you and say, do you want a date nine times, 10 times out of nine, you're going to say yes, but just because. Okay. So, so listen, so if you're a billionaire, you might as well not ask, huh? So if you're a billionaire, you might as well just like go for it without asking. That's what you're, is that your, is that, so like given that, <laughs> given that billionaires will usually respond to bi people who would respond yes to billionaires, then if I'm a billionaire, what you're saying that I should just have my way with people and don't bother to ask for consent. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't put rape culture in my mouth. I'm not a frat boy. Um, but I'm- that's the logical, that's the logical conclusion of what you're, of your saying, like, Hey, people will say yes anyways, if you're so powerful. So why should, why even butter ask? I don't like, I don't like any part of where this is. I don't like where we are. I don't like where it's gone. It's so fucking gross. Your God's gross, sir. Your God is gross. And this story is gross. And we started out with like, ah, oh, but Jesus didn't say the apocalypse. And now we're at this point where it's like, yeah, but like, why did God rape somebody? And I'm like, I don't get it, dude. You know, that that sounds a lot like ISIS. Maybe, uh, even if Jesus was yeah. not like ISIS, your, your his father sounds like ISIS based on what you're telling me it's, right yeah. now. <laughs> Fuck, man. <laughs> I can't. Y'all, I have to go back to work. It was a fun time speaking to y'all. I love <laughs> both of you. I hope... Like, I hope and pray that you all find some joy in the afterlife because I really care for you all and I love you. <laughs> um, but I'm going to continue the- back to work. I had a I had an impressive talk talking with y'all and I wanted to, like, maybe convert y'all, but I, probably I didn't. But salvation yeah. from the Lord. Um, but I'm Dude, a- your uh, your God sounds disgusting and evil to me, and this conversation has only reconfirmed that you have driven me further from your religion through this discussion. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, Camp Bolton every day. Have a nice day. Bye bye. What a deeply, <laughs> deeply weird conversation. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Ahmed and Jeremy signing off. We've we've had a great show. <laughs> 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 Fucking oh. So the uh, what do we come back from that? Uh, hey, it's it, we have a couple of super chats, and uh, then we had a, one more thing we want to do by the end. Do you, are you cool with doing the screenshot thing still? <laughs> we was, we oh yeah, yeah, an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> No, we need something to <laughs> to recover. Cleanse the palate. After that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um. All right. So we've got uh, uh, X million sent ten dollars. Uh, even though I was raised SDA Saturday Sabbath, these shows are my church. Thanks. I love both of you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Um, Miranda Rensberger sent five dollars. Even if Mary's permission was somehow asked, how was she supposed to say no to the holy fucking spirit? There was never any consent. Exactly. Um, we've got Monkey at Typewriter sending two dollars. Uh, great show with Ahmed and Jeremy hosting. Um, uh, Ruben Manzo sent uh, two dollars. Um, it's a crime to impersonate an admiral, sir. I've earned it. I am the fleet admiral of atheist experience. <laughs> um, Oh my glob, dude. Uh, uh, then we've also got some some things. At, at the beginning of the show, the crew was talking to us. They've been taking some screenshots and some comments and whatnot, and they want to throw some on the screen. Can we get number four uh, up on the screen for a second, please? There it is. Oh, look, you got your face in it, too. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you? Uh, so... <laughs> For context, Armin had just asked if I'm God and I want people to hang out with me and they say new, why do I have to burn them? And this apparently is the comment here. Do you want to read it? Oh, okay. So I said, okay, here, here goes. Imagine you really love a girl. So you offer her everything you are and have and have, and you show her, you put guys, please put dots and commas. This is so hard. To do. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you show her your, you love, uh, your love uh, time and time again, even though, even to the point uh, of almost begging her. However, she decides to reject you and leave. Does she still get to have what you are and have? I think not. It's the same case with God. It's not that he himself burns us because he, because we reject him. It's that he is life, love, peace, goodness, joy, patience, and a long, what, et cetera, and et cetera. And we are humans, and we as humans have decided to reject him. We are the girl that decides to go after the guy who seems cool and fun, and at the end, we get nothing. Okay. 
Okay, that's not a good well, analogy. Like Is it a good no, analogy? No. I feel bad no, for yeah, whoever yeah. that person's dating. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 you know, I, I will fix your analogy for you, okay? The analogy, here's a better analogy, okay? Imagine, imagine if I go tell, you know, imagine if I go tell a girl that, please, come to me. I love you. I have so much appreciation for you you know i i will give everything for you and i'm being all the creep and like in her business and like being so acting so desperate and she's like not paying attention to me like but listen bad things will happen to you bad things will happen to you if you don't um listen to me okay if you don't pay attention to me if you don't love me bad things will happen to you and also by the way um I, to to avoid all these bad things to happen happening to you, I also tortured tortured my son, and that is going to avoid all these bad things happening to you. And you're like, okay, this guy seems like a creep. Okay, like he's like you're like no no look, you, you have to believe me you have to believe me. Um, I tortured my son, uh, very in a very gruesome way. And if you just love me, and if you love my son, because we 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 both did this for you. Okay. Um, if you just love my son so much, none of this will happen to you. You will probably run away from this creep, okay? But imagine if you run away from this creep, and because of you, you running away from him, you end up like he knew something, like something really bad happens to you, right? And he could end it any, at, at any point. He also set the entire environment, the whole world, in a way that if you he created everything. So if you say like, listen, it's you, it's your fault. You moving away from God is causing you all that pain he's not throwing you into the fire even though he said in the bible he did literally say that you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire he didn't say like you are just moving away from me and that act of moving away from you is tor torturing you like he said no you're going to be thrown in there but let's assume that that is, is the, that is the case you moving away from me is going to cause that pain but here's the thing i made this I created this so that that happens. Like, hey, you're blaming me. First of all, I didn't know. You didn't tell me that that's how. And if I move away from you, there's no way that I could come back because I'm dead. Now it's the afterlife. You didn't, you didn't give me enough evidence that this will happen to me. You didn't give me enough clues. You just came and acted like a creep. And I just run away from you because you were you were being weird and you didn't give me any evidence that that will happen to you, that would, that will act genuinely happen to me. And now that I'm seeing that that is happening to me, you're saying that it's my fault. First of all, it's not my fault because you set up this environment in a way that that's how everything works. Two, it, you didn't provide me with any clues or evidence that this, would, this is going to happen to me. Uh, you just acted like a creep and expected me to believe you. Three, you could end this right now. I am suffering and being tortured because of it, and you have the power to stop it. But you're like, no, I'm not going to do it because you chose to make you walk away from me. Like, how pathetic do you have to be? Like, how weak-minded do you have to be? Like, how self-obsessed that you have to be that somebody is being tortured, and you you are you could stop it at any moment, even. Even if you didn't create this act of torture, which you did, but even if you did it, you have the power to stop it at any moment. But you think they you're not gonna do it because at some moment, at some point, they chose to move away from you. Like it's it's kind of like watching your ex-girlfriend on fire, right? And not putting it out because she 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 broke up with you. That's what what's happening. You you have like you have like water right next to you, and your ex girlfriend is being burned right in front of you, and she's asking you to pour that water on top on her and stop the pain and misery. And like, I would do it if I was still your boyfriend, but <laughs> guess you shouldn't have rejected me at some point. That's what your God sounds like. It's Doesn't, so isn't funny. that a bit? Of it's so <laughs> gross. Isn't that good? That, <laughs> we just got another super chat while you're talking. Monkey at typewriter sent two dollars. No way, God sends sounds that much like Andrew Tate. And like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it, this is big incel energy from this God of yours. Also, mm -hmm. I missed a super chat earlier. Uh, uh, Ruben Manzo sent uh, two dollars. A forest, as in a collection of trees. Yes, except I have an extra R in my name because I'm a little bit extra cool. Um, also, I wanted to do one more, uh, one more of the 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 the, the screenshots. Number ten, 
If you could pop that up for me, please. Uh, this is right after I had talked. Why that face? Uh, right after I had talked about um, <laughs> how there's more uh, uh, more evidence coming out that not all hunters and were men and all gatherers were women. And you're like, there's actually a lot of crossover there throughout history. And this person said, prove this. Even 50 years ago, most women were stay-at-home moms and the men worked. And this, what's frustrating about this is exactly what I'm pretty sure I was talking about in that clip where people see their own culture and assume that that applies to like all of human history. And it's like, yeah, but mm -hmm. here in America, when men work and women don't wear, they're barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. And that must have been how the cavemen did it then. And it's like, dude, just think about it. You said, yeah, 50 years ago. You know what else is happening just 50 years ago? In 1969 is when California was the first U.S. state to pass a law allowing for no con uh, or no fault divorce. In 1969, women could actually go and divorce somebody and it, without having to have some big legal process proving something. They could just say, I don't want to be in this relationship. In 1974, 1974 is when women were allowed to open a bank account by themselves in this country without their husband's permission. 1974 is where you get some modicum of financial freedom. So yeah, 50 years ago, most women were stay-at-home moms and, and the men went out and worked. And then the culture got better. So do you think that looking at this fucked up, misogynistic, patriarchal bullshit culture and saying, look, this is something that happened in this country a few years ago when we were somehow even more backwards than we were on now. Do you really think that that counts as scientific evidence for what humans were doing 100,000 years ago out on the savannah? Do you really think that we can look at this and say, yes, in my, in my white supremacist, Christian nationalist, uh, uh, heteronormative, cisgendered, uh, uh, patriarchal, hegemonic fucking culture here, it looks like this. Therefore, surely for all of human history, that's what it was. Because I'll give you a little spoiler alert. That's exactly how the field of anthropology started. And we've been working away from it ever since. So like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. Life is fundamentally more interesting than you seem to think that it is. And culture is a lot more diverse than the bullshit that we've been dealing with here. So just try, you know, thinking about it a little bit more and maybe reading. It, it'll change your mind. It's it's always fun when we are doing that. Um, when that the, the clip that comment was on was because we were talking about whenever these publications come out, you know, popular science or, or, or popular mechanics or new scientists or whatever else like that, they'll put out a, a post on Instagram saying, hey, we found this new stuff about women hunting. It's really cool. And all the oh, comments wow. are just full of virgins. Uh, and they're like, oh, you're <laughs> telling me this woman was out there barefoot, pregnant, having the baby on each tit fighting the mammoth and it's like because that's all you think women are ever and it's, it's it's madness oh gosh um it's been a show this 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 show <laughs> will go down as one of the shows of all time um <laughs> Armin, do you have anything else to wrap us up with before we before we proceed to close no i'm good this has been a long show and i enjoyed every minute of it likewise my dude likewise uh, if I, I always love working with you if seth was here i'd tell him the same thing um i'll, I'll tell him later and, and i'll buy him a, a sandwich of some kind uh thank you so much for being here today everybody this, is, this has been a really really fun very long show if you stayed tuned for the whole thing i seriously appreciate that as well uh thank you to all of our crew our moderators our call screeners uh, to all our super chatters to all the people out there watching out there in, in the youtube lands um uh, have an awesome rest of your day. Uh, stay curious and never stop learning. Bye bye.
Watch Talk Heathen Live Sundays at 1 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTH and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TH.